Good evening. I'd like to convene and welcome you to the Putnam Valley Board of Education business meeting of May 20th, 2021. Please stand and join me as we salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I begin, I would like to take note that the Board of Education members um, and staff at the, I guess you would call us a dais, are not wearing masks um, as per the recent CDC guideline. Although masks are still required in schools, there are no students here. We are socially distancing and everybody on, on the Board of Education Administration has been fully vaccinated. So certainly masks can still be worn by anybody if you so choose. All right, after that public service announcement, I'd like to make another one that the treasurer's report for March 2021 is available in the business office. And now we're gonna jump right into some very fascinating and fun presentations. Your build up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'd like to begin by welcoming Ms. Jeanette Mastretta uh, to give a highlight on our special areas program. Thank you. Not yet. Is that better? There, there we is. go. There you <laughs> have it. Quite a bit. <clears throat> All right. So um, our special area education at Putnam Valley Central School District, there's so much to share, and I am glad I waited until the end of the year to share this, but there's also a lot to share <laughs> by waiting till the end of the year, so I'll get started. Okay, our, all of our K-4 um, elementary school students have been attending their 40-minute special block every day, whether they have been in school in person or in, um, per, um, through remote learning. Our fully remote students do have their own specials window every day from 9 to 9.40, where they attend their online special class with their special teachers on their particular day. And then at 9.40, they go back and they join their Google Meet with their regular classroom. So I just thought I would start with this. This is called The Artist Behind the Mask. And um, art classes, as you know, um, uh, were, took place during uh, the classrooms this year in art. Mrs. McCormick travels to each uh, of the, her classes with her supplies. And this year during the pandemic, students created these mask art, which someday I think will be a reminder of this time that we're living through. Very creative, very fun, and this project really helps students with the adjustment to wearing masks in the beginning of the school year. Uh, elementary school art students use individual supplies to study and create projects in line with the New York State Learning Standards, artist studies, thematic units in the study of art. Students' work is displayed in the school and many pieces are often brought home to share. And the following slides are some quick examples from each grade level. So here are some examples from kindergarten. <coughs> it's okay. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Kindergarten students learned about lines, patterns, and repetition in art. Here are examples from our, some of our remote learners, which are on the left-hand side. And this project was modified for them at home so that they could do sort of a scavenger hunt to find their lines throughout their homes. In both kindergarten and first grade in art, there is a focus on art and literacy. Students incorporated literature into their art. Here are our youngest students, our kindergartners. They learned about emus, and they learned how to create fluff through drawing lines um, within their drawings.
Here is another example of kindergarten and first grade artwork that began with the book Every Color. It's a book about friendship, differences in creativity, and our students created beautiful polar bears. Our second graders created mug designs and unique handles using lines, shape, and color techniques. This was integrated into Women's History Month and the 100th day of school. So this, um, this artist here created 100 mugs in 100 days during the pandemic. Our third and fourth graders learned how to create digital art using various digital tools and also learned about the art of Zentangles. They used their knowledge of Zentangles to create um, beautiful sculptures that are here at the bottom right hand side. This is a beautiful um, bulletin board that's displayed at the elementary school. So the music priorities for kindergarten through 12th grade, the music de department set priorities for this school year, and they were to keep students engaged in music in as many creative ways as possible, to adhere to the standards for the arts, give students opportunities to play music with their peers, whether in person, distance, or virtually, to tap into students' creativity and interests to create meaningful experiences, and to develop and create new opportunities for students to perform with each other and assess their learning. So same as art class, our general music in the elementary school with Mrs. Calhoun was instructed initially in the classroom. Health guidelines prevented um, singing and sharing of instruments. So initially students worked at their desks with games and activities to improve their, mu their music literacy skills. Students in grades one through four worked with Chrome Music Lab to compose and experiment with sound. Our first graders created pinwheels, which you can see here on the right side, I believe, um, and compared different versions of the book and song, I Know an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly. With our new guidelines opening in March, general music was able to be moved into the auditorium with 12 foot spaces des designated for um, safety and being able to sing, even though they had to wear their masks, they were able to go in there and sing. And this large space really allowed for so much song and movement. Um, on the left-hand side pictured are our kindergartners and they're practicing recorders on our right-hand side. So the left-hand side, they're they're pretending um, to be caterpillars and butterflies, and they're learning the differences between high and low sounds. And then our third graders on the right. Whoops, did I skip one? Our fourth graders continued with small group band instruction this year in the music room to allow for proper distancing with plexiglass dividers, so we moved them into Maddie Calhoun's room. Fourth graders recorded a winter recital and are in the process of recording two selections for the spring recorded concert. And our fourth grade band, again, some more rehearsal pictures in the auditorium. Technology also took place in the classrooms this year at the elementary school. The instructional topics included keyboarding, digital literacy, sustainability, and social media safety. The same theme was pretty much kept throughout all of the grade levels this year. For example, this month's focus um, is on travel and how to, how to research. Last month, they focused on recycling. And the, the center picture here is third grade. I believe it's Mrs. Romanello and Mrs. Phillips' third grade class that's pictured there. They created turtles that were made out of recyclables, plastic bottles, and paper. Physical education was able to spend a lot of time outside this year. We were fortunate to have good weather. And so they really did take advantage of that. This was actually a benefit to our students during this pandemic. Um, they were involved in cooperative group games, exercises, physical activity stations, and team sports. They were outside, but they were wearing masks, and they were enjoying the outdoor air and exercise. 
Our indoor physical education took place with the two parts split within the gym. So typically our gym is wide open for two classrooms, but we had the split wall. So the two classes were separated. Um, they were safe and they were distanced. Initially, there was lim very limited use of the gym equipment, uh, which was a challenge, so our teachers had to be very creative. And our next two slides just show activities. These are activities were created um, for our remote learners or for fully remote days. Our phys ed teachers really had to think outside of the box to create these interactive activity boards for kids. And they're really neat. Like, if you click on them, so when you roll the dice and you click on them, and it's a good workout. Mm -hmm. Again, here's our third graders in the back participating in phys ed and some more pictures taking advantage of being outside. Uh, so begin, before I begin with the middle school, just uh, wanna let people know that next year the elementary school is looking forward to a new special class. So Mrs. Bruno will be teaching the innovative lab for classes in kindergarten through fourth grade. Her home base will be in the elementary school library. And this special will focus on concepts of science, technology, engineering, art, sustainability, and digital literacy. So we're really excited about this new class. Oops, middle school. So our middle school fully remote students joined each special area class with the teacher. Um, our special area middle school programs really build on the elementary school foundations. In our art classes, students focused on further developing their knowledge and skills related to the elements of art and principles of design. This, these examples here with Ms. Gozola, students created pop art donuts inspired by the pop art movement to de demonstrate knowledge of composition. Students began with a sketch and used oil pastel crayons. These, these donuts, which it's nice to always to look at donuts, mm -hmm. but they are beautiful in person. Um, I can actually bring them to the next board meeting. They, they, they just show depth and color and just such creativity and, and they really turned out beautiful. The digital textile designs were created by looking at samples of patterns and were created using the shape tool in a Google drawing. Uh, th oh, here we go, sorry. Um, this is Art 6 with Mrs. Armbruster. Students experience learning with a variety of different art media and techniques using the elements of art and again, the principles of design. So these are some examples from her class. More examples from Art 6 using cut paper and oil pastels. There were so many to choose from. It was really, it was really hard to just only highlight a few. Uh, students in middle school chorus had the opportunity to not only continue to sing, but explore digital music as well this year. Students composed video game music and sound effects for an animated cartoon using Soundtrap in Music First. Students recorded their voices and blended them together to create an audio YouTube performance of the seventh and eighth grade chorus. And coming soon, the chorus is again recording um, to create an iMovie of the seventh and eighth grade chorus with a slideshow pictures for each student and our fifth and sixth graders will have the opportunity to come together they've already begun practicing in the pack and record four songs that will be shared out virtually so here you can see the students are socially distant wearing masks but practicing in the pack and here's a sort of a wider shot of that Our band students have been rehearsing socially distantly inside as well as outside and will be recording some of the songs that they've been working on this year to send out to families. During the hybrid model, students had the opportunity to engage with music technology and music theory that they may not have been able to do in previous years. And band has really taken advantage of the good weather. I came out the other day to see the whole entire fifth grade band outside in the corner um, by the 
beginning of the trail there and it was just it was a gorgeous sunny day and as you can see the students were engaged not distracted and really enjoying this class technology students had multiple opportunities to be innovators as well as show their understanding of technology through different projects this year that required that they use multiple skills creative thinking and problem solving and design challenges so this is a this is bristle bot, br bristle bot fun with our fifth graders and if it works i'm hoping i have a teeny tiny little video so these bristle bots these little tiny robots were made with the bristles of toothbrush head bristles and this is how they work So as you can imagine, once working and once spinning, very exciting for fifth graders. These are some of our other challenges that our students took place um, and participated in with technology, the paper towel challenge, newspaper table challenge. They had their goals and you know, a lot of this really comes down to um, planning and creative thinking, failing, and learning from that. Uh, this was the marshmallow catapult and the marble run roller coaster. I actually brought for you a little sample. So this is, I could show this after the meeting, but this was one of the marshmallow catapults. And if Very I were right to, at Dr. Left. If I were to go for a Dr. <laughs> left here, it, it really does work well if it's stationary, but like, I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty exciting. Oh, that so, could have been a disaster. I, I have Mateo Sobra and Angelo Sirico's um, catapults here, so kids did a really <laughs> great job creating those. Future engineers. Yes, future engineers. Did we pay our custodians more money to pick up all the marshmallows? <laughs> they're, they're middle schoolers. They probably picked them up and ate them. <laughs> That's probably true. Probably, probably. All right, our physical education program for grades five through eight at the middle school focuses on various team sports as well as fitness and team building. The fifth and sixth graders focus more on small group activities, skill development, communication, sportsmanship, and teamwork. And our seventh and eighth graders build on previously learned skills and apply that to gameplay while still focusing on teamwork, sportsmanship, and communication. Here we see the boys, they're playing volleyball in the gym. And again, these beautiful weather days have really allowed us to be outside. Here are the girls playing field hockey on the turf. And now I'm moving on to our high school. So we're so lucky to have so many, just such an array of offerings for our students at the high school. It really wasn't until I started spending so much time here and realizing how many classes we offer and how much our students have available to them, which is really wonderful. In the area of art, I'll share some artwork from several classes with Mrs. Armbruster. We have AP art examples featured. Our IB Visual Arts Year One. Sorry, get rid of that. Uh, and this is IB Visual Arts Year Two. Media Arts Adobe and Design. Studio and Drawing and Painting. Photography, Darkroom and Digital. Studio Art. Again, this is also studio art. Digital photography in studio art. And advanced studio art. And drawing and painting. These are two pastel works, which are, or three rather, sorry, they're just beautiful. Oh, and again, I was given passed along so many amazing pieces of art. I wish I could be here all night to share them, but Dr. Left will not be happy with me. <laughs> so 
Sorry. Can you go back uh, one? I can't help myself. What's that? Can you, can you go back one slide? Sure. Where am I going? Back? Back. Here we go. Nope. To the pastel ones. The pastels? Yeah. Hmm? I, I just, I can't help but commend. I don't know which students painted those, but. They look like photographs. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. They that are unbelievable. That's and especially amazing. out up close because we have I have the presentation in mm. front of me it's beautiful from here but up close it looks like a photograph in a magazine so I have a complete collection and, and presentation that was shared from Mrs. Arm Brewster and also from Mrs. Furlong that I'll pass along to the board and it has the full collection of all of the pieces that um, include these but so many more they, they really are quite beautiful now when you said advanced I thought they were all advanced so yes, I, like, I know, you know. <laughs> All right, physical education. So this year in phys ed, we were fortunate to be able to take advantage of the new wellness center here at the high school. Pictured here are students who were recently playing competitive frisbee in the new space. And when I say competitive frisbee, it, it was competitive frisbee. They were not joking <laughs> around but it was so nice to, to be able to see them have that space. Um, here's our non-competitive uh, group in the gym, and this new space really gives teachers more options for students to participate in. Um, our remote learners had also had various assignments uh, that included what is to be healthy, athletes and their impact on the world, and historical moments in sports. I just wanna, I just I sort of just want to back up to these two slides for one quick second and just say, having this new wellness center space, I was speaking with Mr. Turner and he was telling me that it's just, it's what is so nice is that they now have the opportunity to offer choice. So for example, here, students were able to choose competitive Frisbee versus non-competitive. And what he told me was that a lot of the students who chose non-competitive were really participating and getting more into it, but they knew that it was sort of like low risk, but they were more into it than they would have been previously. So again, just another um, positive for having this new wonderful space. So this um, was a vision board, which I was really impressed with. Some of our remote learners um, had some of these various assignments and um, Let's slide away on here. Here is an example of a vision board for healthy lifestyles that was made by one of our students. And our phys ed teachers also spoke with um, the high schoolers about stressors and de-stressors. So these were really good lessons that took place during um, remote learning days. And this here, this 2021 vision board, like I said before, was created by a student. So um, being spontaneous, working out, being more active, working harder, waking up early, eating healthier. So despite many CDC restrictions, our music department was able to creatively bring so many opportunities for our students to perform this school year. Uh, students were engaged in music in so many different creative ways. New opportunities for students to perform were developed, and I give so much credit to the teachers and to the students themselves. Students had the chance to create and perform music with their peers, in person, distance, virtually. Our high school mixed choir and concert chorus have had daily rehearsals in the pack. They're now six feet apart. Previously, they were 12 feet apart. Um, vocal instruction has continued, although modified, uh, through remote and hybrid schedules. Several learning units of digitally-based compositions using online plat platforms were incorporated. Uh, the Mixed Choir is currently creating a four-part recording of songs as a memento for this year's collective learning experience. I'm looking forward to that. Our high school band rehearsals, which are again now six feet apart, like I said, it was 12 prior to March. The high school band department was able to accomplish um, all of those priorities that we had, I had previously said was set for the year. Uh, remote students completed individual assignments and practiced the materials um, from, from the given day. Full remote only days 
were filled with various objectives, educational uh, videos, assignments, assessments, individual group meets, and musical joy. High school students were also able to focus on other aspects of the New York State Standards for the Arts this year, which included original music composition and music digital technology. High school music students are currently finalizing their remote music projects for evaluation and presentation. And our IB music class, made up of 11th and 12th graders, were successful and were able to succeed within this hybrid model. Our IB seniors prepared and successfully submitted their music exams in April. So this year we had um, 60 Putnam Valley students from grades four through 11th grade participate in a virtual NISPA festival. NISPA is the New York State School Music Association. Students practiced and recorded their solos uh, they, were, they were recorded and submitted, and some of our middle school students who weren't able to participate this year did, however, participate in the middle school virtual talent show, and that will be coming out on May 25th. So lots to be proud of with our music department. Our Putnam Valley High School Theater Works created the first ever virtual dramatic showcase, Voices from Within the Pandemic, and this really came about because they were unable to do the fall drama, so it led to the creation of this showcase. Uh, and then the first ever virtual spring musical, The Drowsy Chaperone. I also just want to add that the uh, poster design that was created um, by for the uh, voices from within the pandemic was created by students in our media arts class with Mrs. Armbruster. And also, the, um, the stories within it were all written by our high school students and enacted by our high school students as well. It was, it was amazing. Wait, I think I missed one. Here we go. So coming soon, we still have our music. Um, our, I'm sorry, our middle school drama club is in its final weeks of preparing for the recording of this year's musical, Mary Poppins and students learned their parts virtually and now they're being able to come together um, since spring break they've been able to come together to practice on the stage the performance will perform, performances will be on june 11th and 12th and i'm i'm hearing there might be some room for some in-person performancing with some social distancing have to find out some more about that in those dates. Our elementary school musical Make a Difference with a theme of kindness will be performed by our third and fourth graders, and they are currently editing for an upcoming uh, virtual performance, and families will have a link to view that. And that is our special areas at Putnam Valley. That was like a nice blanket. <laughs> just, that was just a really nice presentation. You know, certainly um, our focus is on academics and, and preparing students for the, for the future world. But you explore your future world through the arts and physical activities and technology. So this was, it was nice to see that in this non-traditional year and a half we've just had, um, students were still able to have a high quality of, of these specials. That was great. Thank Very you. Enjoyable. Yes, I agree. And I think that for many of our students, I, I, I remember years ago teaching, teaching third grade, and I remember going to the gym show and watching some of my students who sometimes might have struggled in the classroom, and that was their moment to shine. And I thought, look at them, like this is their moment. And, and whether that was for other students through music, through you know recorder and leading up to band and all of the opportunities that Putnam Valley has, they, they really does offer so much for students to shine sort of outside of the traditional classroom. Can I ask a question on yes. the, the new special that's gonna be in the mm -hmm. elementary school? Is that replacing something or is that gonna be an addition? Yes, yeah, so that's replacing our technology special. What we found is that two things. One, um, a lot of the lessons of, that we currently teach within technology will still be woven within that class. But we've also found that our students are so well-versed with technology right now. Um, it's really in almost every 
content area, and they've had so much exposure. Technology is, is, is really you know, in charge of all of our lives in some way. Um, so we, we really thought about bringing in some more of the um, STEAM practices and sort of making that more of an innovative, hands-on learning experience for our elementary students. I just want to quickly recognize in this presentation just reminds us all for all the obstacles and challenges that were before all teachers this school year in order to educate our students and find a way to successfully do so. If you take a step back and you look at some of these special area teachers, specifically art, music, well, specifically music and phys ed, um, but as well as art in terms of supplies, where they had to be 12 feet apart and host virtual lessons for phys ed and music and art is not an easy task. And I just applaud the creativity that they utilized using spaces, finding spaces, being outdoors, finding ways to actively engage students in person and remotely. And I'm in some ways happy that we weren't able to do this presentation at the beginning of the year because we sort of saw the evolution of these special area teachers throughout the school year as the restrictions declined or decreased. We uh, were able to, they were able to get larger groups of students back together and really um, meet some more of their objectives. So uh, just kudos to all those teachers uh, for continuing to push the envelope and find ways to get their students to enjoy the special areas. I, I do have, um, I don't know if it's both a question and a future meeting conversation. I know I'm supposed to say that at the end of the uh, meeting, um, Dr. Luff, but I'm going rogue. Um, You're the boss. You're allowed to. <laughs> okay. So um, I know these, these are, are what we call our specials, and many of them are obviously required by New York State, PE, music, art, um, I right. believe tech ed, which was a carryover from what was shop class for many of us. Um, back in the day, um, and I think more and more schools are moving more to a STEAM, Steam engineering steps, right. kind of uh, approach. Um, and my future topic is, what about, um, I'd really like to know what our, or, and I'm sure the public would like to know, what our requirements are in terms of the encores. I sometimes think in my head of the encores as also a special, but I know they're two different things. The specials are what we run all year. The encores are specific to the middle school. Um, I think, and what are requirements? I know there was conversation about family and consumer sciences, AKA home economics. Um, is it required, is it not? Um, even at the high school level, I know we've offered financial, personal financial planning. Is that required, is that not? Um, I think it should be, but I'm just curious, what are, what are we driven to do? What do we go above and beyond? So maybe you can answer some of that now, Jeanette, but maybe that can be like the encores and the electives in terms of what are required. I remember being a high school seen, uh, senior mother and not knowing economics was required. Um, you know, not everybody knows that, you know, so mm -hmm. some of that kind of thing. And I think so, a lot of our encores and special area classes are sort of woven right. in, in mm -hmm. together. Um, certainly at the high school, there's, a, you know, there's requirements for a certain amount of courses, and so a lot of our students sign up for those mm -hmm. um, encore classes. In terms of state requirements, I think that school, school districts have some flexibility mm -hmm. in the encores that they um, create and provide. Um, and then certainly there are those that we are sort of mandated to, pr to provide to students. Just a future, because I'm sure the encores can do a presentation and extend you another 30 to 40 slides of right. fascinating yeah. work. Right, so. yes. So I can answer some of those. Unfortunately, I'm sure the encore teachers would be happy to put together a presentation and um, unfortunately are presented by someone different. Um, but I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be more than willing to do so. I can quickly answer, at least partially answer, the home and careers question. The state has um, sort of broadened what was the home and careers requirement, and there's a new title for it, and off the top of my head, I can't grab it, but it sort of gives a, a wider range, but it's really about the same type of skills in terms of um, a personal finance and, and other- um, Is that family and consumer sciences? Yeah, but it's not. It's it's, not it's, it's, it's a much wider okay. array. You sort of have choices in terms okay. of, of what we do now. Um, 
I know it was nearly impossible to even find a mm -hmm. certified home and careers teacher, or facts teacher. So that was why the state, I think, was really forced to broaden that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's plenty of opportunities. The Encore program in general essentially takes the place of what would traditionally be study halls in middle schools, something that I am um, pretty opposed to. So by offering an Encore program and giving students a survey of multiple different what could be electives when they get to the high school, it gives them a sense as to what they enjoy, they get to try new things. And something I knew that we're trying next year in the middle school is to offer eighth grade students the opportunity to have an elective. So rather than encore serving predetermined subject areas, eighth grade students will have an opportunity to sign up for a subject area in which they have interest. So that's something that I think will be a great transition to the high school whereas they work their way through, have more and more opportunities to sign up for those electives based upon interest. Thank you. Thank you again, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette. All right, what is next? So our next presentation is uh, regarding the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association budget slate of officers and board of directors vote. And I will defer to our liaison that will attend that meeting, Ms. Barb Parmley. Uh, yeah, so um, we're meeting on um, May 24th, uh, virtual via Zoom. Um, we're gonna have our annual meeting that way. Um, we have in the pandemic n not had as many programs um, where we all could be together, but they've done a lot virtually. The Westchester Putnam School Boards Association is really represents all of the districts in Upper Westchester and Putnam, um, all of the school districts. Um, we have at our meetings, we have board members, superintendents. Um, they work with district clerks. Um, they provide information, um, facts and figures. Um, the, the information they provide is timely and relevant. Um, they coordinate um, issues between districts or, and between um, the Westchester Putnam school, uh, schools and other schools in the state. They have a strong advocacy program, um, a lot of training classes um, and webinars and um, uh, opportunities to share ideas. Um, so it's really a great um, program. I'm, I'm glad we belong. I hope that we will continue. Um, I will at the annual meeting vote on the budget and the slate of officers, um, but they're the officers you know, that were running last year, so it's not anything really new. Okay. Um, questions, anybody? Yeah. And they really are very helpful. Every so often in the 11 or so years I've been on the board, I've reached out to officers if I've had a question, how do boards do this, is this a board thing? And, and they're, they're so happy when they get a phone call from you because <laughs> they feel like they're, they're really being helpful. But they, it is a good association to be a part of. Yeah, we met at the beginning of the pandemic, we met every week on a town call you know, where districts shared what they were doing, how they mm -hmm. were coping, Absolutely. different ideas, you know, t so that nobody had to reinvent the wheel that, you know, but, and I, like there's a summer law conference because the laws change every, I mean, they provide a lot of services, services to new board members, um, as well as, you know, um, experienced board members, so. I've had an opportunity to sit on a couple of those meetings um, when Barbara wasn't available, and I found them very informative. So whenever you want to miss it, Barbara, let me know. <laughs> okay, Dr. Well. All right, now our next presentation regarding our high school IB program. I'd like to welcome up Dr. Entreri, Mr. DiGregorio, Mr. Mello, and Mr. Lathrop. Did you bring anyone else with you? <laughs> so, the IB dream team. It is the IB Dream Team. So good evening, everyone. It's great to be here tonight with the uh, part of the IB team. And we're proud to give you an overview of the IB program over the last two years, which has seemed like one very long year with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
When I first came to Putnam Valley about six years ago, I had a vision and Dr. Wills had a vision that this high school could be more and could do more to reach its potential. And I'm proud to stand here tonight to say, we're, we're reaching that potential. We're really making huge strides academically that I'm excited that, for you to hear tonight from, from this wonderful team. And I wanna thank the Board of Education for their support because without it and without the funding from the Board of Ed, we could not have implemented the IB program. And thanks to Dr. Cohen, I know this, he's going to be leaving the board soon. And so we, I wanted to thank you from, on behalf of the high school for everything. Stop it. We don't want to talk about that either. <laughs> so there's a lot in the news about building adolescent resiliency. We heard that before the pandemic, we hear it during the pandemic. How do we uh, make teens able to handle the workload, able to handle things emotionally when they go off to college? And I really want to affirm that our IB program does make students stronger academically, emotionally, so that they are able to be more successful when they're gonna leave Putnam Valley High School. When I walk around into classes and I hear essential questions about are uh, humans inherently good or inherently evil, and then hearing students debate that, and these are not the higher level students, these are standard level average juniors having these conversations uh, referencing text as their support, it's amazing to see. And to give you my best example, there's a special ed teacher who works in a collaborative 11th grade English class. It's uh, everybody's taking IB English, and she was at a level 10 of enthusiasm and passion when she came to me because she is so excited at what the students are able to do. And she believed that when she first entered that class, she thought it was gonna be too difficult for the students. But now, after working throughout the year, she's able to see what students are able to do. And she was beyond enthusiastic and is bringing a lot of those strategies and ideas to her other classes in ninth and 10th grade. And that really affirms that story that we are an IB for all school. It's not just about the diploma candidates. It's about what happens for every child in ninth through 12th grade, reaffirming those skills, building those skills so they're prepared uh, for graduation. And with that, you know, I can't compliment this team enough because they, while well, Mr. Mello and I have been contact tracing and doing all the logistics <laughs> with Dr. Luft for the pandemic, we haven't been able to pay as much attention to the IB program as we would like. And it's been like handing off a child to somebody else where we, you know, carefully try to oversee it, but they've blossomed and just taken off uh, without us and just done such a wonderful job really implementing this program with fidelity, authenticity, passion, heart, and I really want to thank them and welcome them up to the podium to tell you the exciting pieces of the program. Well, we just got started. We're already in trouble. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, Rob Lathrop, thanks for having us tonight. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be here to be speaking about such an exciting program. And I'm not sure about Matt and Sandy not really doing much. They've been really involved in it quite a bit extensively. Trust us, they're down in our office quite a bit, uh, overseeing a, a lot, and they're in, incredibly integrated in the program. And we, we wouldn't be able to be where we are without them. So we want to thank them as well for all the work that they've helped us to accomplish. Thank you guys so much. So um, we, want to start with, we want to start with the students. And one of the things that we wanted to mention tonight is that we're trying to show you what the students are producing, because it's really about what the students can accomplish um, in the future and in the now. And so we have this, um, this first quote here um, from one of our, one of our students. Um, you want to read that? Yeah, well, I, I think you should have all the data off. Yeah. Um, IB has been an experience that I would take with me to college and the rest of my life. It has pushed me beyond my limits of what I expected out of myself. It has taught me how to manage my time, think out of the box, and truly challenge my intellectual abilities. After we read it, and that was like unprompted student survey, and we basically were like, maybe we should just go with that and be done. That was like, I mean, really, it, 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 we had to put that in a bottle. We couldn't package a high school senior to, to say something like that uh, off the cuff. Um, so we were, we, we've been getting a lot of this type of feedback. Uh, and th again, these are between diploma candidates 
versus non-diploma candidates, and you'll see some of the numbers, what we'll be able to, what we're pulling off is, is, is pretty amazing for the kids, uh, that, that, are, that we're able to witness what they've been able to, to accomplish. So, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. If you, I could tell you're not going to stay in one spot. So that's yeah, I mean, like, yeah, but can you, could, could we walk and talk with the mic, Dan? Yeah. Okay. okay. You can take it with you. I appreciate that. Otherwise, the people at home can't hear you. Uh, they can read the PowerPoint, though, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Sorry. Do you have movement breaks on your IEP? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Directions explain the whole bit. He can do it all. All right. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the foundation for the future that we have here. And there's really... One of the challenges is there's so many qualities of the program that really uh, we find enlightening and invigorating uh, and just sort of fire us up. And uh, it's, it's, it's challenging to kind of just pick a few. So there are a few here that we wanted to talk a little bit about. One of the things that really excites me is that it's student directed. You know, the, the students are really at the helm of the program here. Um, in the, the teachers are there as in other classes to support them and to nurture them and to bring them along. But in, in the IB classes, the expectation is that the student is driving the work. Um, and what's driving them is, is a couple of things. There's really a need in the world that they need to figure out that's out there. So part of the investigation is, what does this world need? And the other part that they need to figure out is, what, what matters to me? So it's really what matters to the world and what matters to me. And the students at that nexus is where the work happens. And so it's really student-directed. Um, and a, a big part of that are the questions that the students are asking. And I really have to say, <clears throat> when you skip down, having taught AP for 18 years, I love the merits of the AP program. It's, it's pretty unbelievable what, what that program in itself asks of our students to do. But when you look at IB, the fact that there are multiple skill-based, effort-based, and traditional assessments, it welcomes every type of student, not just the super high academic. So if they're, when they're going through any of their IB courses, they're getting assessed through a conversation. They're getting assessed through a question of their own choosing. Like, I mean, how many of you sitting at the, t at the podium there or at home are so much more excited when you're studying something that you're interested in? And that was something that was always upsetting to me as a, as a teacher when we do these high stakes testing and they are getting a question that they're not necessarily prepared for, that it's like, oh, let me see what, you know, I hope the AP gives me something I know, where the IB, because it's student directed, because it's inquiry driven, and there's multiple, you know, it still has those strong tests at the end of the course, but on their journey, they're able to kind of take control of what it is that they're learning about, and, and they're, they're so much more involved and interested. And I have to say, you know, somebody who's, again, I've, I've been teaching for quite a while, I'm learning so much, and I think that I can speak for a lot of the staff that we're learning so much from their interests in all of our different, in all of our different uh, subject areas. So it's just, been, it's just been an awesome ride just to be a part of and kind of work through it, but watch our students kind of go through this journey together as well. Yeah, and, and at the center piece is there, you see that it's inquiry driven. So um, all the research shows that we should have inquiry driving a lot of our curriculum, and that's really at the core of a lot, a lot of uh, what IB is doing. Uh, whoever asks, anybody who's been on an interview committee on either side of it, knows whoever asks the question is really running the show. And so in the classroom, the students are the ones who are asking the questions. They're the ones crafting the questions. And often, these questions take weeks to sometimes months to develop and craft. Um, because a good quality question has, has, has uh, a multiplicity of depth and complexity. And so students are, are trained and practiced. So when they come into my class, and they've already done this in other courses, I can see that the, the skill level is really amplifying as they move toward being able to um, construct these, these thoughtful questions. So one of the things that we're really proud of is that this is a, is a, a program. There's one thing to be uh, a school with an IB program. But there's another thing to be an IB school. You know, it's not like this is an addition onto a house that's already been here. This is now integrated into the entire institution. And some of the information here that we want to go over kind of can help reveal that a little bit. And really, <clears throat> I think that, and just to, I mean, what a strong statement Mr. Lathrop just made. It, it's really as woven into the fabric of all of our courses. Um, it, it is it, it's permeated through the ninth grade. The ninth graders are being challenged with those AP courses the level of questioning, and, and again, it, it's really like, it, it's impacted the, the, the whole building. Again, from the, from the top to the bottom, and I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am because it's really only been two years. So it's like the sky's still the limit here. So, I mean, if you take a look at, at, at just this past year, 
we have, we have 242 students enrolled and they're taking 601 seats in IB classes. So it, it, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, this year, 448 pieces of student work was, was you know, graded by the teachers, worked through with students, um, worked through, you know, through conferencing and, and through class, and, and then submitted to the IB for moderation. 448 pieces of, of work by 242 students. So, so 242 is really just, the, that's just the 11th and 12th grade. So you're talking about a pool of about 290 students, and out of the 290, so around 80, 82, 83% of our students in the 11th and 12th grade are taking IB courses. Any other numbers you wanted to hit on that? Uh, well, um, I mean, there's a, I mean, as far as the, the, the menu of choices the students have, there's 22 IB courses. Um, we added, we're adding three more next year. Um, some are replacing AP, um, some there was room in the schedule. We're adding um, Spanish ab initio, IB physics, and the sports exercise and health science courses as well. This takes up, these, um, the IB courses take up 37 sections in our school. So this is not just a little small sliver or slice of academia. This is something that's expansive. We're really proud of this number here. Um, the average number of courses that a 12th grader takes IB courses is um, almost three and a half. So, you know, while our diploma candidates are taking six, the average 12th grader, by their own choice, is taking, you know, over, over three courses in the IB program. Um, so it's really reaching a lot of students and welcoming in the, the depths and the talents and the, the, uh, the different learning styles that we have out there. So the, the IB is able to reach those students as well. So we're really pretty psyched about that, that um, bit of information that we came across in looking through this kind of stuff. Okay, so at the core of, um, at the core, right, yeah? Yeah. All right. So at the core of a lot of the IB um, that we are so um, struck by in learning throughout this this year is the um, internal assessment. So each IB course has an internal assessment and an external assessment. The external assessment are uh, fairly traditional tests that happened in May. Um, this year, they, because of everything that happened, we, the internal assessments turned into external, and it's a little bit complicated. But just to kind yeah. of just piggyback on the, on the student driven piece of, of, of even their external assessments, which is not in this presentation, within their external assessments that they, get, that they would traditionally get at the end of the year, their traditional based tests that are still chock full of student choice. You know, for, for world topics, they would have been able to pick, you know, uh, two essay questions out of 27 prompts, unlike the AP. Um, and again, I'm not trying to make it IB versus AP, but it just, I lived in that world. That was my life. Like some of you guys have other jobs. Like I lived in that world. And now seeing students have that choice, even within a final externally traditional exam, was nice to see, unlike the regents as well. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so the, uh, the process of the internal assessment is, is extensive. And any, if you talk to any um, teacher who's worked through the internal assessments, or the IAs, as we'll refer to them from here on out, um, it is involved. It, is, it, it, it kind of can dominate the classroom. We all know if you're working on an IA for your other class because we hear the students talking about it. Like I'll know when, they're, oh, oh, that's right, they're working on their history IA right now. So that means that's gonna affect my class. So it takes a ton of coordination because the IAs are um, sort of their own, own life, life force that we all have to be aware of as we're working through because they take up so much energy in the class. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the process of that. So one of the first things the students have to do they have to understand the rubric and the task for each IA. Um, some of them are intricate and involved. Uh, they're, they're pretty complicated and layered. For example, just to give you a quick one, uh, in the language and literature course, students are tasked with finding a global issue that matters to them and to the world that's transnational. Um, so it's not just happening in our own little place. Um, they find two texts that speak to that. One of them is a literary text and one of them is a non-literary text. And then they speak about that for 15 minutes in a conversation. So it's not an essay, it's not a multiple choice test, it's an actual live conversation that the students, all they have there is an outline that they're speaking about. So um, it, it welcomes in a, a range of talents and challenges and skills, um, and it, uh, just understanding that alone is a pretty, pretty great challenge. Um, what, what, what fires us up is, well one of the things that fires us up is that they have to develop the topic and the question for the investigation. That's on them. So we'll say to them, what global issue are you interested in? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And then they know. They come up with it. Because they, things do matter to them when they're asked with that. 
uh, and the things that they come up with you know, are, are remarkable. And it's, a, it's just a real honor to get to work with them and to have that, that conversation with them and to have this recorded and see these kids performing in front of you. It's like, I can't believe this is happening right now. This, and I'm asking questions live to them and they're responding with these, these thoughtful um, answers. It's, it's, it's sort of overwhelming sometimes how, how well they can do. And when you think about blooms, you think about synthesis and analysis. I mean, this is just all over the whole IA process. You know, you, you're, they're researching and they're creating, they're collaborating, working with others, with their teachers, and, and they're doing this in every course. So all about three and a half, our average student, three and a half of them are sitting in, in an IB course. That means they're gonna have four IAs, three or four IAs in, in an individual class. That's what, they're, that's what their day would look like. So they're, they are really accessing the past rote memorization and, and through the, the, again, the research process and then the questioning and then narrowing down that question. And then, and then finding out that some of their own biases are, are wrong or that they were carrying a bias into a research paper is priceless. It's just absolutely priceless. Um, so we've been, th this whole this process is really, it's not something that's a fly-by-night. It's not a one-time thing. Uh, it's something that, that gets worked on throughout a semester. And, uh, and like Mr. Lathrop said earlier, Rob said that it, it just, it, it's kind of an enjoy to watch the, the students finding a topic or finding a science question. I mean, you want to be totally awestruck, and you're going to see it because we, we we don't do it justice what our students are doing, um, and so we have a little bit of a bit of a video to kind of show you. But well, ask them about their math ideas. You know, like find go and find a student that that that, that took a math class and ask them about their math idea, and then have your head just be like, I didn't even know that was a question. You know, Kai, you would love them, all of them. Um, <laughs> Might have been over your head a little bit, but some of them, you know, you can be <laughs> probably roll with it a little bit. You know. Um, and speaking to uh, the teachers, the, uh, the, the teachers were sort of awestruck at the, the amount of work that the, in a year where everybody in the whole world um, had to adjust and recalibrate and, and dig as deeply as possible for all that resilience, um, the teachers did as well. But one of the additional challenges or opportunities, however we want to frame it, was that the IB program was new. Um, and so we're teaching new curriculum, new philosophy, and one of the things that was new was a teacher commentary and scoring. And for each one of those IAs, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it, it's an extensive process for the teacher to actually um, conduct, um, teach, work through, and then actually write commentary on the students based on really strict criterion, and then send that off to the IB to be moderated. So it's a really uh, elaborate process that, that, that um, we all undergo going through. And the teachers have just blown us away with the work that, they're, that they've been doing. Um, so we submit that to IB for evaluation. So that's really a quick look at some of the, uh, the process for the internal assessments. So we wanted to talk a little bit about, we just wanted to show you, um, just to give you sort of a quick viewpoint of what it looks like. Uh, we have this assessment calendar. So this is not something that just happens in a vacuum. So this is just some of the uh, internal assessments here and the calendar that's required to manage all of these things as we're going along because we have a lot of students who have a lot, a lot of work to do. So now teachers are forced, or continue to, to uh, I won't use the word forced, um, have the, the awareness, the awareness okay. and the, the, the opportunity to speak to others outside of their own classroom. So I needed to know what was going on in environmental science because I knew I needed to schedule my work in a different time. So there, this is just all of the work that they're doing. And if you're a candidate, you're doing all of this. And it, as, as um, uh, Vin said, if you're a senior, then you're doing three and a half of those kinds of things. So it's a, a pretty, um, pretty elaborate process. And if, you, if you think about, the, if you went back to that last slide, all of those little benchmarks in the process of just the IA component of these courses, and, and then you think that that process is happening with each student in each course, in each IB course, it, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big, um, swath of, of the of the student body that is having that experience with an advisor with a teacher with the you know refining a topic or working on a lab and, and they're doing that they're from class to class to class so it, it's really when we talk about we're an IB world school it's not just a program in our classrooms look different because of it you know now we're, we're working on kids to help self-discovery not that we always weren't doing it before but this kind of formalizes the process um. One of the, uh, this slide were really, I mean, the, the library, and I don't know which organ to use, if it's the brain, it's the heart, we could fight about that all day. But in terms of its, its um, functionality in the, in the school, it's probably a little bit of both. 
but certainly not vestigial. Oh, oh they, look at this guy flashing the vocabulary. Just throwing it out there. Thank you for that. Vestigial organ. All right. Um, so, uh, no, it's certainly not. So we have this information here about the utilization of scholarly journals. So what are the students using? What are the resources that they're using to come up with these fantastic um, uh, um, constructions that they're creating? So one of the things that um, Mayor Fran Domain, who's you know, really a superstar and, and has helped the entire group, so she really works with everybody. The library's been buzzing with liveliness you know, since the beginning, but there's a little bit of a different um, note that we're hearing now in terms of the scholarly work that the students are producing. So, I mean, if you look at the Academic One file and the Academic One file select, you can see the, the increase in the amount of uh, resources that the students are accessing. You know, it went up 76% in terms, I mean, that's not a small number, from 601 to o over 1,000 of students searching for these. These are, these are complex, peer-reviewed, scholarly journals that they're going to be using when they go to head off to school uh, in the future. So it's like programs like JSTOR, you know, JSTOR, they're, they're using, and this is not just Wikipedia, and they're, and they're finding random sources. These are, these are academic, like Ms. Williams said, peer-reviewed, good sources. And if you think about it in, in the, the world that we live in today, half of the battle is finding sources that you can trust, or at least understanding that there are biased in sources. And the fact that we, are, we see this type of increase in, in the, the level of scholarly work that student, our high school students are reviewing, there's zero doubt in my mind that these students are more prepared than students were three years ago. And I think we did a pretty damn good job three years ago, but the program itself has kind of fostered the growth of, of this type of research and questioning um, and, and just literally, uh, you know, the, the live use, use, proper usage of the library. Has been really. You, if you ever get uh, Mary Fran Domains here, you know, ask her about this. I mean, she's been so excited about the resources that have been coming in and out, and what they're what the students are choosing to, to read. I mean, to go up 560 uh, percent, you know, in in, in students ser searching for you know authentic, you know, uh, peer-reviewed, well-researched, well-documented kind of material is, is really is sort of mind-blowing. I didn't even know percentages went that high. So that's <laughs> you know, uh, it's really impressive. Uh, we were 97 in the American history work. Um, students requesting for articles has increased by 38%, and interlibrary loans where um, pretty much Mary Fran runs to different libraries and picks up books at different places and brings them in and has them. And this year they were down at the lobby, there was a stack of books with kids' names on them for the research paper that they were doing for the different classes because kids were um, realizing that, you know what, actually I need a whole book on this. I can't just find one article. So um, really, really, really excited about that, that work that they're doing. Yeah, right now. Let's, let's hear from the kids. Nice setup there. <laughs> it's almost like you knew it was coming. I know. All right, in their own words. Oh, you just you brushed that out. You kind of let them at me. It, it, it just, right, it, it, go, it went It's through. in their own words now, in their own words. In their own words. So here's a, it's a, a video. So we. Oh, I, is this, uh, well, we're going to see a little bit, but we will talk about it. You, you want to know something amazing? So we're sitting here, Mr. Lake and I are sitting here, Mr. Dr. Jerry, Mr. Mello, and we're like, how are we going to show how great this program is and what students are doing? And, and literally, we, we I, I don't know how, through IV Film, we went down to IV Film and said, listen, would you guys mind you know, t talking a little bit about your, your IAs and the process that you were in the different courses? And, and within like, I don't know, a half hour, our little room there turned into this unbelievable uh, you know, film set. Like with the, with the, the guy with the, the thing on, oh, next, you know, like. Action, one, yeah. Action scene two, the lighting's off, lights coming out. People are taking this stuff to the floor, kind of like we see out here. But it was amazing because they were in charge. They were in charge. We just kind of stood back and like, this is the, the, we didn't have to twist anybody's arm. There was no like, we're, no one did this for a grade. This wasn't like, oh, we'll give you extra credit or an extra community service hour. But through IB Film, they were so confident in just coming in and, and, and shooting all of this for us that we came in on Monday and they were like, here, we, we did this. Yeah, and, and Catch Ups was instrumental in helping you know, create a, a, a program where this thing, and, um, and, and Dan's a big part of that as well, you know, they're creating a place where students can function on their own and just, we were really, we were just, we just needed to step aside and ask them to speak about it, really. Which is a lot of what this program is, just stepping aside for the students' talents to grow. Was, whether or not, was looking into whether or not one's perceived beauty of a given biome correlated with how willing they were to divert resources in order to protect it. 
I did this by compiling a list of questions that I thought would be important to ask in a survey, both about the biomes in question, as well as other factors that might influence someone's opinion on protecting the environment. And then I compiled a survey, sent it out to everybody in the school, and computed the data that I received back from receiving the Google form uh, through an Excel spreadsheet. Hi, my name is Brian Carroll, and I'll be talking about my IB English I.O. So my IB English I.O. was centered around the theme of constructing your identity, and I also talked about the global issue of uh, the media's influence in constructing your identity, especially in today's modern society. So that's what the IB uh, English I.O. All, is all about. It's about constructing a theme to go along with the global issue and then relating them between two different texts. Uh, but in this scenario, it was interesting to delve into different texts, quote, quote, because I actually talked about a movie rather than just a book and another book. So it was interesting to kind of relate the same issue between uh, non-traditional texts in an English class, like such as a movie and a book. Hi, my name is Lindsay Cohen, and I will be talking about my world topics, IA. I started off by uh, finding a bunch of sources that supported my topic, which was just the beginning of the whole process. Um, history is something that occurs throughout like a long period of time, so I needed to find a bunch of sources that represented events that were occurring throughout the time that I was investigating. I investigated how civil rights um, were affected by the Great Migration period. Hi, my name is Abby, and I'm going to be talking about my math IA. So I really like the IAs as an opportunity to explore something that you're interested in, um, and in math, it was really interesting for me because I was able to look at a topic area that I probably wouldn't have been able to explore in class. So I explored the logistics of long distance space travel with considerations for time dilation. So I used the formula for time dilation to discover how this would really affect rocket ships and it increases exponentially. So someone on Earth would experience a lot more time than someone on the spaceship because of this dilation. Hi, my name is Alyssa Racinos, and today I'm going to be talking about my film comparative study. I, the good thing about film is that you get to choose movies that you like to do, so I got to choose two movies that I really liked that showed the portrayal of homosexuality in different cultures, specifically in men. So I got to do Call Me By Your Name and Love, Simon, and I looked at different cultures, so Italian and American, and the whole editing process was really fun. I got to do um, a lot of comparison that I wouldn't have done if not for film. And as a result, I got to see um, portrayal of homosexuality and the growth that it has done within film. Hi, my name is Molly McKay, and today I'll be speaking about my French IA. So for my French IA, I did an oral presentation, and my teacher presented me with several images that I got to choose from. And then when I chose one, we had a conversation about that. And after we had a conversation about an additional theme, for my picture, I chose an image with Maghreb, and Maghreb is a French-speaking region in Africa, and I was able to make cultural connections with the image about other things I learned in French class, and that's one of the great things about IB is that we're able to make global connections from things we've learned. Hi, my name is Aaliyah Steele, and I'll be talking about my biology IA. My biology IA was looking at the difference between scenes and objects, and then how past memory influences your visual processing. So I definitely took the topic that was interesting to me. I always find it really fascinating that the brain can sort through visual information in less than 13 milliseconds. So I really recommend using a lot of hierarchy in your IA. So really doing kind of a funnel, so starting with background research, and then going more specific to what is the gap, what's missing, and then how this research that you're doing is going to solve that. And then also looking at multiple levels of organization. So for me, that was from neuron to brain to behavior, but it might be different for you. Hi, my name is Alex Weller, and I'll be talking about the Computer Science IA. So the Computer Science IA um, is required that you find a client that is in need of an app, and you create it for them. So my, app, my client was Mr. McManus, the physics teacher. Um, he asked me to create a kinematics calculator for his students, and I used Java to do so. My name is Ethan Brown, and I worked on the Chemistry IA. Uh, so the Chemistry IA basically is you find the research question that is unique and important to you, and then from there you conduct a study following that process. Uh, I studied the efficiency of groundwater systems, and I subdivided that into uh, three questions. 
How does flow rate affect pH? How does flow rate affect uh, mineral contact, content? And uh, how does flow rate uh, affect water conductivity? Uh, my name is Ethan Sanchez. Um, I did the IO final for IB Spanish. Um, the process of studying was pretty easy. You just have to understand some of the like vocab you know, to describe pictures and things like that. Um, actually doing the IO uh, was better than I thought. I just did it over uh, Google Meet with my teacher, and um, I just had to talk about a photo and then answer questions after. I'm Liana Diodati, and I'm going to talk about the IB Music IA. Um, for the IA, we had to um, compose two pieces of music, each three minutes in length, and we had to um, record 13 minutes of performance. For the compositions, I wrote a clarinet duet, and then I also created a piano and vocal piece. And for the performance, I did a lot of musical styles ranging from a Broadway soprano solo to a um, original guitar song. So through this, I was able to learn a lot about music, and I was able to take the skills of recording and writing um, to what I need to do in college, which I find very helpful. Hi, I'm Madeline DeVito, and I'm an IB psychology student. And our IA is um, a paper based on experiments that you had to conduct. You pick from a list of pre-existing psychological experiments, and you pick one that's of your interest, and you and your group members um, have to you know, pick it, um, conduct it, and just overall replicate the experiment to um, make sure that the experiment is reliable and you know, psychological researchers replicate experiments on the daily. My study was the effects of leading questions on memory. That's what we picked. So we had to make a, an experiment and it was quite easy because we had a good background of cognitive knowledge. So we knew how to conduct it. We knew re research methodologies. And so it was quite simple and I learned a lot from it. I mean, how impressive, right? Really pretty unbelievable, and, and I have to say that so now each one of those students did another, you know, five other IAs or four other IAs in their classes. So it, it pretty, it, it's mind blowing. The other thing I think it's important to, to mention is they did this within 40 minutes. Like they came down, they didn't know they were even doing this. And they, they spoke without notes, and it gives you an idea of how much they actually knew about the topic. This wasn't something that they were just going to remember for some test. This was something that they were passionate about that they wanted to speak about. And it kind of got a little bit weird when people were like, no, 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 I want to talk about my bio IA. I want to talk about my, the, my math IA. So that, 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 that conversation happened, but at no time did they have to take out a notebook and look at it and say, oh, this, was my this is what I wrote. That was all from the top of their heads within a half hour, 40 minutes. And then you know the editing and how well spoken they were, I mean, really, it, it, it was, it was, we were just, we just sat there and it was almost, it was, we're so happy we can bring this to all of you and all of you at home because it was just so nice for all of us to see them take the reins and, and them share with something that they were passionate about. So it's like, he who, he who sacrifices most or they who sacrifice most are, are less willing to give up. And just to watch them, they sacrifice so much in each one of these IAs that they are going to carry that with them throughout college and throughout the rest of their life. So it's really, it really was just, just an absolute pleasure to watch. I mean, they truly sound like dissertation topics. I started jotting down things I needed to Google to figure out what they were. I, I need and then I got the time dilation and I just gave up. Um, <laughs> well, I'll look at the slide, but that's all I could think about. It's these students are halfway through their dissertation for a uh, doctorate. Yeah, so I mean, there's you know sometimes criticism of societies that we we, we consume too much, and, and and sometimes in academia there might be a consumption. But these are these students are not just they're not consuming; they're creating. You know, they're 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 adding to the academic conversation. You know, they're they're contributors. They're not just receiving; they're adding to the the world of knowledge uh, with with their efforts and their passions. And uh, we just are continuously blown away and uh, like uber grateful to get to work with them uh, in such close uh, um, um, capacity. Uh, if you ask any of the students, they're not, they're not all like, it was awesome, it was the greatest experience in my life, I would love to do it again. Typically the comments, because we ask them a lot, we check in with them quite a bit, 
Um, and we survey them in, in a couple different ways. And the response is always pretty much the same. Like, it was really, really hard, comma, but I think it was worth it. Uh, and so that's, that's a pretty honest assessment of where the students are. Um, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, and um, you know, as, as Vin mentioned, you know, there was an IA for each, we, we tried to get an IA for each subject. And those students are doing IAs in all of those subjects. So they're having that experience in a range um, of um, academic worlds. And they really are all that rich, by the way. Yeah. They are all that rich in, in topic and choice and creativity. Um, so it, we wanted to give a little bit of a snapshot of some of the reflections and observations some of the teachers made. We have a, um, a few thoughts from some of them um, as well. Uh, so we're seeing, one of the comments that we, we're hearing is that we're seeing a deeper investment in their academic product. All right, Students care about what they're studying and they're recognizing that academics is something that can be produced and created. It's not something to be regurgitated or handed back to the instructor. It's something that they can actually build themselves. Um, it's, it's not about teaching rote memorization. It is about teaching ideas that inspire students to want to learn. Students leave an IB class and are excited to research, discuss, and grow their knowledge. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Through the IB program, we are creating lifelong citizens of the world. And you notice this is an excerpt, because we asked a number of teachers, hey, can you give us some thoughts about IB? And, and it was like, the messages were like, you know, 50 pages long, like, we don't have that kind of space, you know. <laughs> um, but they, they could all wax poetically about the, the program as well. Uh, and one more thought. From the curriculum to the assessments, the International Baccalaureate Program allows students to academically thrive through its emphasis on and value of st individual student thought. And so you're seeing a lot of this, these themes of individuality, thought, authenticity, uh, passion, you know, echoing throughout the, the, um, the halls of the students' minds. So we want to shift gears a little bit and talk um, you know, about a, a, a portion of the program. Uh, as we mentioned, it's an Ivy World School, so it's integrated all throughout the school. But we have, you know, sort of a capstone of the IB program is are the diploma candidates. Um, you know, we're lucky to have one of our superstars here with us um, in, in the room. Jess, we're, we're all a little bit smarter just by being around Jess. Uh, probably a little bit tougher as well. Um, so the, the students in the diploma program, they have to take six of those IB courses, which I'm just exhausted even just thinking about that um, on their schedule. Um, plus the core, which is the theory of knowledge class, or as you may know, we call TOK. Um, their extended essay and CAS. So it's a lot. Um, and, uh, and we're really proud of the, the amount of students and the students that are in the program. Um, uh, so we have 16 in our first group. We have eight in our current 11th grade who are um, looking at the seniors a little bit like uh, enviously as they're beginning their EE process and creating them like they're already done with theirs and they're sort of, they're beginning this they're this more than a year long process of creating a paper. That's a long time to work on one piece. That's just for the EE. Uh, and then in our 10th grade class, our rising juniors, we have 20 um, signed up. And there was an incredible amount of interest from that group as well um, that we're really psyched to kind of be able to have 20 in the program. Yeah, I think when you look at neighboring schools, if, you know, if you guys are bored, and you can go and, and get some <laughs> research on, on neighboring schools, we are so ecstatic because our numbers are actually percentage-wise of diploma candidates. Students that are willing to do the diploma are, are, are way high. For, for a second year program, um, the, the type of interest and buy-in that we're getting from students and faculty, you know, and I have to give credit to Dr. Entreri and Mr. Mello, uh, and obviously the board and Dr. Luck and everybody else, but it, it really, there's a lot of excitement around the program. So when we talk to others, they, they might have two. You know, locals, two people that are willing to do all this extra work um, to receive an IB diploma. And so we, we're really proud of, you know, the, the, the type of shifting that has happened in the school because sometimes we have students who really want to take the program, but we, for sequencing reasons or scheduling reasons, it becomes difficult because, again, six courses, right? So you're looking at those, our labs are attached, uh, the music requirements. I mean, it's like, it's, it's just, it's so big, it's hard to fit it all in. I mean, if you ask any of our IB diploma candidates, 
there's not a lot of free time. <laughs> there's not a lot of free time, and they still play sports, and they still get their community service, and they're still doing all these other great things. So it's really, it's, it's just, we're excited about the growth and, and even where we are. Yeah, we have to thank uh, the creativity of the guidance department who's really helped make this process as, as seamless as it has been all along. Um, it's, it's not an easy task to fit all these pegs into the, into the right spot. So they really uh, have done yeoman's work in trying to make this happen. There's no flexibility in those numbers. For instance, you wouldn't have uh, next year's class growing because they, it takes two years to do it, right? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again? On the previous slide, they're showing eight for next year. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way that number increases because it takes two years to get there, right? Right, I mean, there's a possibility that uh, if they had already taken the six classes, that they can try and catch up in their core work, um, but it's un it's very unlikely, and it would be a, a rare it's student for that to happen. Unlikely. Yeah, we, yeah we, did have one. we had one. We had one join. Yeah. join. We had one exit and one join within, within the year. Yeah, but uh, it's it's that's I, I would think that's most of them happen pretty uncommon. Yeah, they're they're pretty embedded at that point. Yeah. I'm just going to chime in. One of the reasons there's an eight there is because when we get the candidates for the next year, last year we were in the midst of the pandemic and it was just, we couldn't meet with students the same way we did this year. We, it was very difficult to communicate with them. And then there were also some sequencing issues that Mr. Mello and I reflected on. Uh, so for instance, in 11th grade, we've now offered IB Spanish ab initio. So instead of students just taking Spanish four or IB, anybody who's moving on in a language has the opportunity to take an IB course. And that helps us with the diploma candidate numbers. And then it helps, of course, a greater access for all, which is important. That's why she's the boss. But also, it's, it's very important to also note that eight at most schools is, is, is like a, a large number. What'd you say, Jess? So almost has two. Okay, and is this time for one quick question? Um, are the six courses the life of their time in the high school? It's not their senior year. I'm terrified to think about such a thing. No. No, <laughs> no it isn't. It isn't. It's, um, yeah, each course is a two-year course. Okay. So okay. they would take their math or language and literature, their uh, history course, and each course is a two-year course, okay. yeah. yeah. Which is a, which is a, which is a, um, Still a paradigm a shift yeah. mm -hmm. from what we're used to. Um, and sometimes you get to loop with students, so you're developing this unbelievable relationship, mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you're building something that's not just going to be accomplished in four quarters. You have two years to, to kind of establish the, the work, uh, which even that is, is sometimes almost, it's, it's tight because there's so much to, to work through. Um, we wanted to ask this, we have a quick little, uh, I think it's like two, two minute video of the students talking about the core program. So. Um, the diploma students, as you, as you, I'm sure you know, take uh, TOK, EE, and their CAS, and they each spoke a little bit about them. Hi, my name is Emma, and I'll be talking about the extended essay process. This process was for one of the IB assessments along with TOK and CAS, and I got to choose an independent research study that I researched over the course of about a year and a half. Uh, it was a 4,000 word paper. I was assigned an advisor in a supervisor in the subject field that I chose. And for my study, I chose history, and my topic was a, an analysis of the conservatism of the American Revolution. Hi, my name is Abigail Lauder, and I'm going to be discussing the theory of knowledge oral presentation. Now, for this presentation, students are able to select a real-life situation that they have personal significance to, whether it's just interesting to them or they have a connection to, and then they extract a knowledge question from it and make a presentation analyzing that knowledge question, forming claims to answer that knowledge question, as well as addressing potential counterclaims. Now, for mine, I talk about personal bias in lawmaking, and the real-life situation that I was looking at was the Fairness in the Sports Act, which was signed in Idaho in 2020. Now, some of the lawmakers said things such as, boys are boys and girls are girls. No doctor, no judge, no lawyer, no Department of Welfare is going to change that or make me think otherwise. And this really got me thinking about how personal bias may have an impact on making laws, especially laws that are aimed and geared towards the LGBT plus community. 
And so I formed a knowledge claims that I don't think there is any place for personal bias, especially in lawmaking about a minority. Hi, so I'm Alina Steele, and I'll be talking about CAS. CAS stands for Creativity, Activity, and Service. It's a way to kind of offset a lot of the intellectual demand the IB diploma program. So it's a way for you to show how you can be active in the community as well as creative. So in my kind of portfolio, I guess the biggest tip I can give you is to try to incorporate things that you already do and are interested in. So for me, that was a lot of stuff with STEM or jiu-jitsu or swimming. And then also to make sure that you're very reflective and talk about how this has induced personal growth in you or just some of the experiences that you've had that are on a global level, not just community. So you see, they're not tackling light issues. These are real life, authentic, um, in, in, um, in our present world topics that the students have to work through. Um, so there are 16 um, extended essays, and we have to, I guess, compliment, congratulate, laud, celebrate um, both Mary Fran Domain and Alexis Thornton for their work as the, they're the extended essay coordinators. And this probably doesn't happen uh, in, in the first year with the, like the glorious success that they had without those two, you know, corralling and, and helping coordinate the whole um, EE program, which is pretty, um, pretty extensive. And, and really, not only are they coordinating the students, but they're also coordinate, coordinating the supervisors. Through that EE process, um, Emma Jaffis mentioned that each student is assigned an advisor. And that advisor is it, it, very reminiscent of, you know, writing a senior thesis where you're working with an advisor throughout. Did you look at this resource? Did you do that? There's, there is an entire process of, of formulating, um, you know, conclusions through that extended essay process. And they're working with their EE supervisor as if, you know, uh, certainly a college level capstone or, or um, you know, an undergrad thesis. And it, again, between um, Mary Fran Domain and Alexis Thornton, they just, they work so hard to match students up with teachers and then, you know, develop those topics. So it was really, again, another thing that was just, um, just astounding to watch. And I, I hope you guys get a chance to read some of those extended essay questions that are up on the, on the slideshow. Um, I, I want to touch upon a couple, and there are 16, we just grabbed a handful. Um, so we have uh, the, the range of topics, so uh, I know it's a lot of text, but um, let me just read a few of them. To what extent is the chemical layer by layer self-assembly process of spin coating a better alternative to the technique of immersion for biomaterial that can be used for tissue engineering? So there's that, so. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I mean, I think we've all grappled with that question before. <laughs> Where are the subtitles? I don't understand. Yeah. So there's the, there, and then the, then you have ones like, um, in the math in the math world, an analysis of the use of induction proofs in pure mathematics puzzles and real world reasoning. Then you had one of my personal favorites because uh, I got to work with this student. In what ways and to what purposes does Tomi Adeyemi's *Children of Blood and Bone* address systematic oppression through a feminist literary critical lens? Another light topic that. Um, just the student felt like playing around with for a year and a half. Um, uh, I won't say who wrote that, Jess. Um, to what extent does the anatomical structure of a male and female athlete have on their biomechanical movements that affect the likeliness of ACL injuries? This is uh, topics that matter to the students that they're pouring their hearts and souls and minds into figuring out answers to. To what extent do the film elements, such as mise-en-scene, cinematography, and narrative of horror films, such as Split and The Roommate, stigmatize individuals with mental illness. And then uh, we heard a little bit about this one in the video. Was the American Revolution a radical movement to break from the past or a conservative endeavor to preserve the pre-existing social and political order and restore traditional English liberties? So just a smattering of this is just a handful of the, uh, and, and they're all, as, as Vince said before, they're all this great, you know? They really are all this remarkable, and, um, and the, the advisors and the students really work incredibly hard to make these things come to fruition. These are really um, lengthy papers where the, you know, sometimes the, the bibliographies and works cited pages themselves are longer than some of the papers we've written previously. Um, so for our uh, cast, one of the things that's, um, and, and many of you had the opportunity to watch some of the cast presentations, um, which, you know, which some of them were just you know, heartwarming and stunning and, 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 uh, and inspiring. Um, one of the things that strikes us about it um, 
and, and strikes also the coordinators, uh, Andrew Bailey and Ryan Elsasser, who do a fabulous job of juggling all the different elements of the cast that is sort of like its own little animal. I have to mention something. Go for think it. About Grab all the other, think, about, think about all the other academic pressure that comes with all of these classes. And now you're asking them to like go outside and do something meaningful. It's like, what? I have to do that? So to watch the, to watch the uh, Ryan and Andrea, you know, kind of cajole, work with, meet on all the extra time that they don't have has been, has been a marvel in itself. Way more than a, of, of an art than a science. You know, applying just enough like, hey, you got to get this done without, you know, having kids wince in, in, in pain of, of how much more do you want me to do. Um, so it really it was impressive to watch the two of them work together with, with this group of students. So it certainly hats off to them. And again, you guys got to see that um, last week and the week before. Uh, and, and the reflection component is a huge part of the IB, all the way running, coursing throughout, is um, requiring students to reflect on the academic work and what matters to them. And so we just snagged one, um, uh, this, an excerpt of one. The most important thing a young girl could... The most important thing a young girl could have is confidence in herself to do and develop what she wants to. And that can make or break a girl in sports. Regardless of the sport played, it's vital for a girl to be confident in herself and abilities. My goal is by using my video to develop their skills, they can silence the thoughts of being less than and grow their confidence and drive. Now, I'm not sure what else needs to be said about students engaging in work that matters. The third leg of the three-legged stool of the core program uh, is the theory of knowledge. Uh, and we heard a little bit about that before. And so one of the requirements in addition to their presentation, is they have to write a paper. And they're given these titles that they have to sort of understand, figure out, and then choose what to work with. And we just wanted, instead of giving you all the papers or excerpts and papers, we wanted to just give you the topics that just give you a glimpse of what theory of knowledge uh, looks into. We had students auditing this class who weren't even getting credit for this class, just going there because of um, Dr. Macera, who does a, a marvelous job of engaging the students in like, you know, um, really complex uh, and original thinking. Um, so some of the topics of the paper are things like accepting, so they'll get this statement and they have to write a paper about it, uh, as if they had written enough papers already. Um, accepting knowledge claims always involves an element of trust. I think we could all um, grapple with that idea a little bit. What do you mean we have to tr trust? Trust it sounds like an emotion. Knowledge sounds like certainty. How do those two things coexist? Well, that's the kind of thinking that they have to do with that. Um, within areas of knowledge, how can we differentiate between, differentiate between change and progress? I love that question. I mean, how much change happens, how much progress happens? There, sometimes those words are used um, synonymously, but they're not. And the student has to illustrate that through two areas of knowledge. Um, this is another one of my favorites. Uh, labels are a necessity in the organization of knowledge but they also constrain our understanding. So a student gets to play with that idea. So we label things, but we're also constraining things. How do we categorize and organize, yet not limit at the same time? How do we, how do we play with the two ends of that rope at, without tightening the knot of awareness too much? Um, this one's for uh, Dr. Cohen. Statistics conceal as much as they reveal. <laughs> All right. Um, we, we saved this after our statistics page. We didn't want to do this too early. Um, Areas of knowledge are most useful in combination with each other. Um, and the theory of knowledge class requires them to have uh, multiple areas of knowledge to communicate their topics. Can I ask a question on the, on the mechanics of all these core? Are these actually individual classes or are they over and above regular class? Like I'm imagining this is a, probably a class. You got um, that. But the other two are over and above. Exactly. Um, the one thing that I think it's... it's it, and obviously, maybe it's not obvious, but these, this type of questioning and this level of philosophical thinking is now imbued in our other courses through the students. They're coming in, when, you know, you'll be in a class and we'll be reading, reading a, you know, a primary source and out of the gate, you know, a theory knowledge question will be like, well, who's the audience and when was this written and how do we know that they're telling us the truth? And then you're like, whoa, I, you know, we don't really know, but we're going to try to do our best we can to, to figure out the answer to that. And, and the level of discussion um, has, has totally increased. Um, 
I guess, the, or the understanding in discussion has, has, has increased exponentially. Trying to understand what someone else is telling you, and then also that you see the element of trust. Like, am I trusting you? How do we know that what you're telling us is true? And questioning your sources, again, in, in, in today's world, as you all know, there's no more card catalogs, there's no more go, go to the card catalog and flip through the Dewey Decimal System and then find the source. That used to be a marvel. Now we are loaded with statistics and sources in every subject area, and, and TOK has kind of grounded the runaway statistics and grounded the runaway, I read this on Twitter, so therefore it's true. They, they are, they're holding themselves and their peers and their teachers a little bit more accountable from just being frivolous what it is that they're saying in class. And that is now, in, it, and, and it, again, it's only been two years. So I'm like, I can't tell you how excited I am because I do feel that this is, is something that's permeating through all of our courses. And when, you know, obviously we can't run from it because it's, it's a lot of it is, most of it is student driven because they've been exposed to this level of questioning. You know, formulating their own ideas, understanding that they, they cannot possibly know everything um, but also respecting other people's opinions. So it, it really, Dr. Mercer has done a great job, and like Mr. Leitzer said, um, that people are just showing up to TOK because they're excited that they want to talk about w what's going on in there. So um, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's a lot of excitement. I mean, we can, there's so much more I want to say, but. Is TOK time, available to all? It's a, a great question. Uh, yeah, so it's, we're, uh, we're working on making that available to everyone as it's a really sought after class. Yeah. Um, and opening it up to uh, certificate candidates, you know, who are the non-diploma candidates. Um, that's that's world-changing thinking, and we really want to welcome in as many. It's as a class I want to take. Yeah, yeah no, we we all do, <laughs> especially with Jerry too. You know, um, it, he he does a, a marvelous job of, of working through that. So, um, we just have a little bit more uh, to kind of give an overview of the of the program here and where the students where this is sort of going forward and how this is manifesting itself. Uh, Mr. Mello, everybody. Hey, how you doing? Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, so you can see that there's, there's an incredible amount of stuff going on when we talk about the IB program and uh, the effect that it's had on our school. Um, uh, you know, we'll start here with students, right, and, and how it's really changed the rigor, um, you know, for the students and how it's really challenged them at different levels and how it's really become accessible for everybody because that's our main goal here, right? Dr. Ventura talked about that at the beginning. We are IB for all. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Lathrop, Mr. DiGregorio talked about, um, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, every student can be successful, right? We, we can challenge every student, but every student can be successful, um, you know, you know if, if they are willing to go and, and dive into all of this. Uh, a couple of really interesting things up here. Um, we look at uh, the 2018-2019 school year when we didn't have IB in the school, we had AP, and we had a, we had a really good, solid AP um, you know, courses in our school, um, and you can see that 222 uh, students took a total of 334 AP exams. And that's a good number, right? When you think that predominantly that's 11th and 12th grade that were taking AP exams, and um, we did have one 10th grade AP world history course at that point. But look at the change that starts to happen in 2019-2020. Um, you had 159 students taking AP exams, um, and Mostly, those were 10th graders uh, that were taking those exams, with the exception of, say, AP Physics. But the majority of those students were 10th graders taking those AP exams. Um, and we had 215 students involved in IB courses. Keep in mind, too, IB courses, two-year course. Um, so these are students that are taking a, a high level um, or uh, a rigorous course of study for two years, uh, you know, culminating with the exams in, this, in year two. Uh, and then you can see 223 AP exams. Again, that's mostly underclassmen. Um, and then 65 IB assessments. That was because we didn't have, uh, we didn't, like the, the year two students, we didn't have, right? Um, that's really a reflection of the students that took IB chemistry, IB psychology, IB bio, bio and IB computer science. Uh, so 65 students enrolled in those classes, predominantly seniors, um, you know, taking those. The, the, incredible jump is where we look at this year, right? Um, and, this, and we look at this year in the middle of, of a pandemic, which is also pretty astounding. 142 AP um, students, 242 IB students, and 188 AP exams. Those 188 AP exams 
there are uh, 29 students in an AP physics course, so they're seniors. The rest of those are all ninth and 10th graders. So we pushed AP world history down to ninth grade. We brought in AP European history for 10th grade to help set them up with some of the rigor that they're going to face when they're heading off to go for um, their IB courses. Or if they're looking to do the IB diploma, they've now faced two years of some rigorous courses in that. Um, AP um, composition, uh, language and composition is in 10th grade now as well. So we pushed that down to 10th grade because the 11th and 12th graders have an IB course that they can take. Uh, so you look at this and there's a total now of 384 students in our entire high school, which is more than half, okay? If we're talking 550 students, somewhere around there roughly, um, 384 were taking higher level courses, right? Um, and then we had a total of 636 exams uh, or assessments that were taken this year in AP and IB. I mean, we start with the students and we look at this, that's the students challenging themselves, right? We still have all the other same courses that we've always given, you know, regents level courses, things like that, and all these other electives, but they're choosing these courses. They're not choosing, the, or they're still choosing those electives, but more and more of our students are choosing these courses um, to challenge themselves. And if you saw the titles of those IB courses, there's some really diverse IB courses that meet the needs of a variety of student interest. So, you know, it's really transforming what we're doing here, and I can't say how excited I am about seeing those numbers. Just another chart, kind of give you an idea uh, if you're visually uh, into, into graphs and stuff. Same information, but that's what it looks like. Uh, you know, students on the left side, number of exams uh, um, is, would be the second one grouped together there. So again, pretty amazing uh, to see the, uh, the level of involvement we have in uh, these challenging courses. So, um, so again, we're, we're, there's a lot to be proud of. Uh, and, you know, and we're always proud of the students where they're heading up in terms of looking towards the future. We have some really uh, exciting stu schools that the students are getting into, as you can see up there on that, on that slide, you know, anywhere. Um, you know, Harvard, Hamilton, Tulane, these are schools that, that might be new to our, to our district. Um, you know, RPI, NYU, Trinity, uh, Brandeis, uh, Northeastern Michigan State. You know, these are uh, really top-notch schools that are lucky to have our students. And our students, we feel incredibly confident they're going to succeed when they get to those, those you know, um, those institutions. Um, so we just wanted to highlight some of the places that they're, they're going to be at, Bryn Mawr, Binghamton, you know, that they're going to be ending up going up. Not a complete list. This is just what we kind of fit up there. No, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, this is, this is all we could fit. No, that's really, really how that goes. Um, there were a lot of people involved in the entire program. Obviously, we have to thank um, all the teachers. We want to thank the IB teachers um, for sort of, you know, this sweat and effort. And uh, it, I'm sure there were plenty of tears along the way. Um, helping guide the students throughout this process, um, and the, the students. The willingness to get out of the comfort zone. Yeah. They've been for 15 years. It's hard to get out of your comfort zone and to kind of you know change over the reins and, and say this is going to be student driven. And and they really they they hit it head on. They hit it head on. Everything changed, and and we're really again blown away by our colleagues um, to be willing to shift the paradigm. In, in again in the middle of a pandemic and a new program, and and, uh, and they they did it. Pretty much with smiles on, for the most part. I at least, yeah. At least when we see them, they're all you know, <laughs> smiling. You know, they're, they're, and 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 in those who are teaching other classes as well are part of this as well. You know, this is a this is a whole team kind of thing. So the ninth and tenth grade teachers are aware of what the students have to end up doing down the line. So they're adjusting and shifting and growing uh, and and changing their classes as well. Um, so that's that's a testament to their professionalism and dedication. Um, uh, Lynn Keller. Uh, was really helpful in helping develop this the, the presentation and research. You know, we really we go through when we need something uh, smart, and, and and Lynn always comes through. Uh, Mary Fran, um, uh, Domain Adele Foster, Carrie DeSiena, Cat Shuts, and then our student uh, our student film pros. We had we could have pulled from any, but Abigail Louder and Ariella Rogers were behind the camera, uh, putting this whole thing together and making it look easy as they so often do. So we wanted to thank them, and of course we have to thank um, Dr. Intrieri and, and, and Matt Mello uh, for their support uh, 
It's, it's remarkable how much they can pull off in a day. <laughs> it's dizzying to watch them kind of move through the hallways and the classrooms uh, and, and, and making people happy around them as they're doing it and then dealing with the two of us as we're trying to just help coordinate this program and keep it going forward. So we're really, really lucky to get to work with them. Can't say how lucky I, and blessed that I feel that we get to work with the team that we work with here at Putnam Valley. You know, and thinking, you know, 20 years ago, you know, Rob was year one and, and I was year two, our class, and, and always envisioning some, a program like this and uh, to see that schedule change and to see IB come to fruition, it takes great vision, it takes great commitment, um, and it took somebody willing to take the first step. I mean, we go back to the, you, Maureen can talk a lot about those days before, you know, in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. But to see where we are now and, and where we're going, it, it's a tribute to, to certainly our leadership that we've had and, and certainly board support. And uh, thank you guys so much for, for, for coming through this with us. Thanks. Um, so I, I want to point out like a major thing here, right? Um, you know about what happened here uh, at the high school. Uh, when uh, you know when we brought brought this in, we brought in the IB program, and I think that's like one of the most important pieces to point out. We brought in a program, um, and you know I'll just read a, a quick definition of a program: a system under which action may be taken toward a goal, right? Um, and I think this is the thing that uh, is going to, or hopefully you realize, this is what is going to solidify our school. I mean, for years we had, we had a lot of really good teachers, um, but we were kind of working as disparate parts, right? We weren't really working together. And when you bring in something like the IB program, you create a common goal, right? By creating that common goal, you're creating common language, right? Um, you're creating common skills, and that's what we see the, the students are getting. And it's so much easier for that student to go from one classroom to another Right, because there's a common language and there's common skills that they're using and developing in every one of those classes. And then those skills are helping them in all those other classes that they're in. So it's very important to understand, like, this is a process, okay? This doesn't happen quickly, it's, an, it's a process. And in that process, um, it took Dr. Entreri, um, you know, developing a team um, that was willing to go and research what IB was all about. And it, 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 it really comes from, um, the, uh, the, the teachers giving their input and feeling valued. And then that leads to valuable teachers, right? And you know, in doing so, we're now starting to all work together, right? Instead of trying to force something into to a place or whatever, we're, we're creating a situation where people are going to work together because they really believe in this, because they are a vested part of its development. And I think that's what's really led to this amazing, you know, uh, peace program that we are seeing right now. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what I realized, or Dr. Anchuri and I kind of realized reflecting, once we, once we started to get it rolling last year, I think we kind of reflected back and we were like, like, oh my gosh, like that was an incredible amount of work. Um, but we started to realize what we actually did. I think when we were in it, it was tough to understand. Um, but you know, when I say we, I'm talking about as, as, a, as a, a, a school. We were able to bring the departments together, right? Those departments were then now working together to figure out how they were gonna offer these IB classes, right? But in doing so, they all start to develop an interest in the IB program and how to make it successful. Right? And that, that language or that, those conversations were happening in every single department, right? And that's happening in the school. And now we're at this point where we're really, really invigorated, right, by what's going on with IB. But keep in mind, we are in the infancy of this, right? I think, you know, Mr. Lathrop, Mr. DiGregorio talked about this. Th this is only our second year of having candidates. And we haven't really experienced the full IB process because the external assessments Right, we're canceled the last two years. Um, so we're still learning and growing, right, as a faculty, as, as, a, as a school community. We're still learning and growing. We have a lot more to go, right? Um, we still need to keep building capacity, right? So that, you know, when we have a teacher retire, we have other people that can step in. Uh, you know, or when we talk about capacity, um, that our ninth and 10th grade teachers, you know, fully understand what's going on in 11th and 12th grade, the conversations with them, 
they are trying to start to incorporate you know, all these IB things like TOK into their classes, and they want to know more about it. So like I say, we're in the infancy of that, and we're looking to move forward and keep moving forward and keep building on that excitement that we have. But remember, it's the infancy, right? We're just taking these steps forward, but we are so, so excited about where we are in year two, and we can't wait to see where we are in year five and year 10. So again, thank you so much for having the faith in Dr. Entreri and the high school to bring in a program. It took five years to get there, six years to get to this point. Um, and it, it really took faith on your part, right? And, and understanding that this is a long-term commitment um, and by having or understanding that long-term commitment, you all are starting to really see the benefits of this program. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Well, certainly an incredibly um, impressive presentation um, because of the students. You guys were good too, but um, it's just unbelievable um, the level of thought that we're teaching our students. And, and that's, that's um, I really don't even have the words. You know, I can always come up with words and it's, I don't have them. I do have silly questions. Some of the students said IO and some said IA. What's the difference? Thanks, that's not silly. Or is it just a book, uh, vowel? <laughs> uh, no, there's, there's a slight difference in one of the, in, in two of the subjects, the language, the language subjects, it's called, they refer to it as an IO, standing for individual oral, which oh, okay. is the actual IA, that's okay. all. Um, yes, and, and we're, we're often less speechless at the student's talents as well, so we have, <laughs> you have a partner in that. I wanted to, um Thank the taxpayers for making it possible <laughs> on the you know on two days out from a, a um, an election and a uh, budget vote. So none of it's possible without their yes votes. So I want to thank them uh, because it trickles up from them to make it even possible. Um, if does anybody else have any on that? I've I have a kind of a downer question. So if anybody else wants to chip in okay. before I go, okay. Um, <laughs> this is fantastic. And I, I love it. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited by your excitement. Um, but on this, at the same time, um, I, I would really like to know, and maybe this is for you, Mr. Mello, or you, Dr. Intrury, the um, you know three to seven percent of uh, the high school grades are below 64. What are we doing for those that are not uh, probably not part of IB? Um, but you are not succeeding with with passing grades in some of these classes. Really, you know, there's many different types of students and many different um, needs for different students. I'd like to a little bit know about that. And, and that's a great question, and one that I'm also proud to answer. And while they're busy doing this, sometimes I am tied up with those types of issues. So especially we start with seniors every three weeks. We have meetings with the teachers where they identify students who are either, depending on the goal, they've either, their grades have dropped, they might be um, showing more emotion, they might be showing stress, they might be, um, have been absent for a long period of time. Remote learning is not something I recommend. There might be a rare student who you know might have been good for homeschooling and where remote has worked but we have students who are failing who we are begging to come back because they do better when they are in school and it's very very difficult to get them back dr luft had read the uh, numbers for us the other day there's still about a hundred students who are remote in the high school the psychologist and social worker have, in fact, they finished the other day, but they have made personal calls to every remote student to find out why they are remote, to find out you know, how we could get them back. Uh, in some cases, because of the remote learning, they've gotten jobs. So they attend their classes and, and then they go to work. And so they don't want to come back to school because they won't be able to do that. In some cases, there is some, uh, paranoia or worry or concern about the, uh, the illness that they could bring home the sickness to their relatives. In some cases, they've developed now a social anxiety where they don't want to come back to school. And, and it's, it, how do you overcome that? 
So we've, we've tried to set up plans for students. We have students who come to the library. At one point, we had so many individual students in the library who we were easing back into their schedule that we had to come up with a classroom for them because we couldn't fit any more up here. It was making the library unable to be used. We have people sit outside of guidance. Uh, the guidance counselors are working with students. We have students who are also a, a, a really a big disappointment to me this year has been BOCES. And I've been in a lot of discussions with um, uh, Dr. Doherty about that. BOCES has been remote as well for many students. So those students are going to BOCES because they like the hands-on learning. They need the hands-on learning. And they're not gonna attend welding or attend forestry if they have to go on a computer and, and watch a video. It's, they're not going to do it. And so we do have more than ever our students who are failing BOCES. And how do you overcome that? So, and in fact, I was talking to Mr. Campion today and he has one student, I've seen him call the mother every day. The student sits outside of guidance. He gets the email from the BOCES teacher, walks over to the student, talks to him, did you do the simulations? Really trying to coax students through the bitter end. We have a, another student who, you know, they're through Remind texting the guidance counselor every day and the guidance counselor's like, you still owe three assignments. I mean, at this time of year, you see the guidance counselors running around, really working with each individual student to get them over the line. We, we work a lot with the psychologists. We put kids on pins. We have Achievement Center. The Achievement Center has been a blessing. We have people like Mrs. Thornton running it, who works with students, like as a case manager, communicating with parents to see what the child needs. It's, it's a whole school effort to get these kids to, uh, to be successful. And it, it's a lot because we do have students, you know, there was, there's a student today, and again, I know Dr. Doherty's familiar with this, you know, they're having, they're having some mental breakdowns. They're, we're having a severe mental health crisis, those students who are remote, and because of what we experienced in the isolation. And we're working on it, but we, have, we haven't solved it. And this summer, that's part of our plans is, you know, run by Gina Fry and the psychologist, is to have these picnics or get-togethers with different teachers and different activities to try to make it see appealing, to have them come back, to have them join. And working with big buddies, working with older students, it's a multifaceted, you know, approach to get these students to be successful. It's worrisome. It's, it's, it's a bigger problem than Putnam Valley, and I only can hope that the commissioner, you know, does not promote remote learning because it's, it's really hard to get them back. Because it seems as though ninth grade has got the biggest, is one of the bigger struggles, and they've never seen the high school. You know, it's, and so they don't even know what they're missing yet. So I, so I, I didn't want to end on a downer. I'm sorry, I really am, but I had to ask the question. But no, it, it's a very yeah. valid question and one we struggle with every day. And, we, and Dr. Doherty has been great about trying to get us resources and support and help, but it's something we definitely we worry about and monitor on a daily basis. And um, this is along the same lines, but I don't think as much as a downer as <laughs> Ferraro is. Um, I think it's very, it sounds like for the diploma students, uh, the measurement of the IB successes is, is built in. It's fair, it's, I don't want to say it's fairly easy, but it's built in, in terms of the essential es um, essays and all the other points. I'd love to see work on, you know, there's been long conversations, and Ms. Grover, you kept talking about your life in AP. Long conversations are, are ninth graders emotionally ready for AP? Um, our 10th graders at that same level of inquiry, and we're now giving it to them. I'd love to see us make sure we're measuring and assessing that. I can't imagine they're gonna off the bat, you know, be incredibly successful, but how are we measuring what the IB skills are doing for those students? So it's interesting. I've had the joy and the pleasure of doing the, uh, eight, starting the AP exams the past two days. And so I've seen the ninth and 10th graders, which I haven't gotten to know as well as the others because they haven't been here. And you know, there's nervousness, they've never taken AP exams before, but you know, they're, they're, they are, they're the open vessels, they're excited. And we talked about, look, you don't have to send these AP scores out. 
right? It's about the experience. It's about reading those higher level documents. It's about writing so that when they do get to IB, it's not a shock to their system. So we had how many in uh, AP Global today? 56? Yeah. That's nice 56 number. 10th graders or 9th graders sitting there and uh, taking that exam and they stayed the whole time and we're, you know, it's the experience mm -hmm. and, and they can do it. Just like the special ed teacher who talked, I talked about in the beginning was surprised that our students could meet those expectations. Our students are meeting expectations. We've raised the bar and they're going there. Thank so you. I just want to jump in real quick. First of all, um, I was lucky to have the opportunity to attend many IB presentations during my time in curriculum instruction. And I want to say that that presentation was the best and most inspiring IB presentation I've ever seen. And I work here. And I knew a lot of that already. So um, <laughs> kudos to all of you. Um, I have a feeling this could become a road show. Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm totally in support of as long as you uh, leave after your classes on Friday and return before them on Monday. Because um, <laughs> I know we can't, we can't operate without you guys. Um, I did want to point out just a couple of things. First of all, I loved what uh, Mr. Lathrop had brought up about the person asking the questions as sort of the star of the show. And I think that's just a great lesson for every classroom in this district. Uh, when you sort of you walk in and you see how many questions are being asked by the teacher, and what the level of engagement of the students is compared to when you walk in a classroom and the questions are being asked by the students. It's like a game changer. Uh, just so quick, messy math, you guys had brought this up. 242 students in the class uh, taking IB classes. And Dr. Jerry and I had several conversations about this, and I know that we are totally on the same page. The strength of an IB program is not the number of students who pursue the diploma, although I, I'm still astounded by the number of students who have done that. But 242 students, juniors and seniors. Now, right off the bat, you can take off essentially every junior from that number because IB uh, in English, all the students are taking IB. But that leaves about 100 or so, using my messy math, seniors enrolled in an IB class. Now, I challenge anyone sitting in this room to think back to your senior year, and I don't care how big of a class you had, but consider 66% of your class as seniors taking an IB course as an elective. Nobody's forced to do it. They all volunteered to be there. I used to have these conversations with my uh, honors physics kids in the beginning of the school year. I don't care if your mother told you you have to take this class, if your guidance counselor told you you have to take this class. If you don't want to take this class, you don't need to be here. So let's get that straight. 66% of our senior classes are taking these higher level uh, courses, whether it's an SL or an HL course, because they want to and they want to challenge themselves. And I think that number alone, 66% of our seniors challenging themselves. When I was a senior, it was about what was the minimum number of classes I needed to take in order to get out of here to go to work to make some money before practice started, right? That was, that's a, that's a typical high school senior mentality. I'm going to college and I need to get in and out so I can get all this stuff done. And that's simply not what's happening here. So the, the obvious um, academic rigor that is now existing in this building, I think, is um, overwhelming. I think the fact that we have freshmen and sophomores taking APs, I almost don't care how they score. The fact that they're willing to sit down in that class and challenge themselves and tackle difficult content because they want to, is to me just a, a tiny little token of the transformation that's happened in this high school because there's many high schools that if you offered AP courses to freshmen and sophomores there would be no interest. Um, so I think the exposure, the experience, the language, the, the confidence building just by sitting in those classes I think goes a tremendous way. It speaks highly for our students and um, highly for our teachers in order to be able to challenge them. So I could not be more proud of the building administration, of our coordinators, and of our teachers as a whole, and certainly, most certainly, our students for challenging themselves. So I thank you all. I appreciate everything you do, and I know the students do as well. Thank you. I'm gonna clap. <laughs> and I need a, to make an appointment with Jess to uh, talk about children of blood and bone. 
but I need to read it a second time, the, read the series a second time, because I'm not nearly prepared enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, if you can come with a definition or a description of time dilation for next board meeting as well, <laughs> I would appreciate it. It'll save me the time researching it. I, I was looking it up. It's rough. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up 50 years ago, and I'm back now. <laughs> I need to get read it. that book, those books get it. again. Time dilation joke. Is the third ad yet? On that note, Ms. Jess, you're up. No, I'm just wondering if the, the next series, I'm, I'm talking about books now. No, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> I, I took over your job. I introduced Jess to the mic. Go right ahead. That's good. <laughs> I didn't oh, think so. Not on okay, thank you. I pre-ordered it on, I pre-ordered it on, uh, Whatever it is, I'm I so excited that I get to talk to you about books too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so hi everybody. Um, I'm just gonna. I wanted to touch on a couple IB things that they were talking about regarding, you know, general student feelings and vibe and stuff like that. And then also my personal experience. But I just want to go over for if the, if there is anybody watching at home, just student events that are going on. Just reminders. Um, AP exams are happening. Um, I've talked to a couple of like uh, freshmen and sophomores on my team who took the AP today and they had to go to a game after and you know they were stressed out but I was like okay it's, it's okay it's all gonna be good um, seniors senior week is coming up soon um, prom is June 2nd if you haven't ordered your tickets get the tickets now they're you're not gonna be able to get them after Friday or next Wednesday it's either Friday or next Wednesday they haven't give the cutoff date yet um, so get those soon um, what else was the other thing I guess we could just go into the IB thing. Um, basically, I just wanted to start talking. I think that the general consensus on IB of the student body right now is that they view it something similar to AP in that it's meant for, meant for advanced kids. But I, I like, genuinely do believe as IB is incorporated more so into the curriculum and within a couple of years, it's not going to be viewed as an AP class and one of the things that I really liked about IB was there wasn't one big final exam at the end of the year that was your entire grade was riding on whether or not you got those college credits the exams were broken up so that way you there was it wasn't all weighted on this one thing where if you woke up one day and you had a bad day the night before the day before or something like that your entire college credits and saving all that money isn't relying on that um, so that's really good um, just for the col regarding the colleges, um, keep in mind that all those colleges, all their acceptance rates went down this year, especially the, hol the harder schools, because, um, because, a lot, because, because the SATs were not required for a majority of them, pretty much all of them, the amount of applicants went up. So getting into a, that hard of a school with an even bigger applicant pool is very impressive. Um, schools that I applied to that were just a shot in the dark, I ended up getting waitlisted too, and I was like, oh my god, I thought I was going to get rejected. I can't believe I got waitlisted. I do think that IB made a difference in that decision. Um, talking as an IB diploma candidate, um, the EECAS and uh, TOK, I think you all remember the last time I was singing praises about TOK. Mm -hmm. I love that class. Um, it's the only discussion-based class that I've ever been in, and I thought that was really cool being ex um, exposed to that, because I, I know that a lot of colleges, I, I, I know colleges uh, offer those types of courses, and um, being exposed to that was really cool, and that was, if, it really is a student-driven class, because I, I commended, I told Mr. Macera, that Dr. Macera this, and I was just like, I don't know how you keep your mouth shut in this class, mm -hmm. because we'll be talking about things, and he just sits back and watches and lets it happen, and all he does is he just prompts another question. And then everybody's sitting there like, I don't know. And then we're talking about it, and then we kind of come to another conclusion, and it, it always ends up being like, well, I guess it's this, but it's also this. And he's like, so what about this? And you're like, oh, we just came <laughs> to this conclusion, and now you're asking me another question? Um, so yeah, um, the EE. Very personal to me. Per um, Mr. Lathrop was there. I was crying at my final uh, reflection because I was just kind of like, it's done. <laughs> and I've been working on this like really personal topic um, that I'm really passionate about. And I'm like getting emotional right now. <laughs> I'm writing about this really passionate topic. And um, I had the experience to do this. And now I'm done with it. And it's just kind of like, oh, finally. Um, 
so yeah. Um, I think that also like IB, and I think I said this the last IB presentation that we had when I was Mr. Mello and Miss Intrigue were giving it, and I had a discussion with Mr. D and Mr. Lathrop the next day in school about it because they were watching the board meeting, and it was just kind of like you know. The world is constantly changing, and it's very hard to keep up. Have a, I recognize that it's hard to have a curriculum that keeps up with everything and is trying to meet everybody's needs. And I do think that out of everything that I've personally been exposed to, IB is the best option out of those. Um, and that's just my personal opinion. But I, it, I think it's difficult to keep up with everything, and I think that IB is giving the best offers for it. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, I think, all I wanted to touch on. If, I don't know if you guys have any questions for me as a student perspective um, on some, some of these things, but yeah. Hi, Jess. I'm going to need tissues every time <laughs> you speak. Um, back in the fall, you called TOK life changing. Yeah. Like, I remember that. And you I, when to, Mr. Right. D was talking about uh, like TOK questioning, just like Twitter and stuff, and I was like, no, that's too shallow to explain TOK. It was much more foundational in my thinking process, so yeah. Just, I don't know why we invited the rest of you. We could have just had, I mean, we really, you know, thank, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, there's no better tribute than watching a result. Oh, also, um, okay. the other thing, I is not being the only testing thing. I feel like it's much, I guess, conducive is the word for it, in that pretty much all of the teachers, I mean, all of the teachers at Putnam Valley High School are very understanding and sympathetic with the students, especially the current norm that we're having right now and everybody's situations. And I think that IB is allowed the, 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 the teachers to be flexible with us and that it's like they don't have to meet these super hard deadlines. I mean, obviously you have to meet the hard deadlines for the IAs and stuff like that, but it's just kind of like you're working at your own pace and it allows them to be more understanding with the student and have that personal bond. Um, I guess. One of the things that I have discussed with a lot of the IB diploma candidates and that we are kind of frustrated, and it's not a Putnam Valley problem, it's an IB problem where the IB exams were a lot of money. And when you're an IB diploma candidate, that tallies up. And, it, and um, IB didn't give anybody your refunds. So I don't know if um, this is something you might want to like prepare for in the future of making that accessibility for students because um, some, I know that some people can't afford that similar to Lee, like AP and stuff like that, so yeah. That's a good point. Go ahead. Do you want to read my report as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I know you're still pretending that you're not going to be a teacher one day, but all the educators standing behind you listening to you talk right now, I, I have a feeling they're all on my side. Maybe after your successful medical career, you can be no, a teacher. I can't do blood. I'm scared to do anything else, too. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Thank, Thank you, you, Jess. Thank, Thank you, Jess. That's why we teach. Next time, wear a jacket. <laughs> Are you cold watching? No, but I'm cold watching her. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, Dr. Left, go ahead, try. Yes. <laughs> Can we table my reports later? Nope. All right, I'll be quick. Um, I do want to thank all of the community members who came out and supported our budget this week. Uh, the budget was successfully passed, 430 to 309, although I certainly wish there was higher numbers. I'm grateful for those who came out and supported our budget because our budget obviously directly supports programs like the one we heard about or all the programs we heard about especially our teachers and IB program uh, tonight. I do want to welcome Miss Helen Horvitz as our new board trustee and she'll begin effective July 1st 2021. Just a quick update on our director of curriculum instruction search as I had previously mentioned we had over 70 applications we did 15 virtual screenings and we invited the three finalists in for a combination presentation and committee interview. Uh, there were about 24 members or 12 in each room uh, that consists of community members, parents, students, teachers, support staff, and administrators. And just 
uh, I want to commend the work that all three finalists put into uh, the thought that they put into their answers and the effort they put into their presentations, and they all did a tremendous job. Moving on to our next vacancy, our Director of Physical Education, Athletics, and Health position. As everyone now knows, Mr. Burrow will be resigning at the end of this school year to assume a position as Assistant Principal at Menacing Valley. And we have already posted the position. We have a little over 30 applications so far, and that posting closes on Monday. We do have screenings, or we will be setting up screening uh, interviews next week and then moving forward with a very similar process uh, in the following weeks. Just a quick congratulations, a couple of them. Uh, Mrs. Leah Steele was recognized by the Lower Hudson Council School Superintendents with a scholarship in the, during a virtual ceremony last evening. The Putnam Valley Ambush, which is the board members will remember, there was a request by a couple of students to form eSports teams. I didn't realize that, I think a, two years later, um, we would finish second on the Eastern Region. Uh, two teams actually finished second in their respective divisions or respective games. Uh, one lost to a team from Kentucky and the other one lost to a team from Maryland. So it was very impressive. Mr. Glenn kept us apprised throughout the process. Um, if they would make the playoffs, if not, they made it. The up 64 teams and they kept winning and winning and winning and got down to the finals and unfortunately, um, neither team won, but that could, pretty impressive in their second year to make it that far. So uh, just again, kudos to Mr. Glenn and the students for uh, pitching the idea and making this all possible. I do want to also uh, just recognize one of our teachers, Ms. Alexis Thornton. Uh, she was invited to participate in the leadership initiative for language learners, and that's like sort of a two summer commitment for her to work with innovative language teachers um, from around the region. We had this past week, one of my favorite activities in the entire year, the elementary school read aloud. And um, that was a great opportunity. I got to read to a third grade class, actually one of the split classrooms. So I was sitting in the doorway reading to two classes. Um, but just being there and seeing the kids face and having an opportunity to share. I don't remember the number, but I want to say there was 36 or so um, volunteer readers who zoomed in or, or personally joined classrooms to participate. So that was great. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about COVID during an update. This will be my shortest COVID update ever. Uh, the positivity rate for Putnam County is actually down to 0.6%, which seems absolutely amazing, considering where we were just a few months ago. Uh, the vaccination rate is up to 55.5, but the number I like better is 60. This is the Putnam County vaccination rate, 55.5% of eligible people, but it actually 67.2% of eligible individuals over the age of 18. So we're almost up to 70% for individuals over 18. Obviously, uh, it was just made available to uh, 12 through 15 recently. Vaccination appointments are still widely available. Putnam County has been able to get Pfizer vaccine, which is the one that's currently approved for individuals uh, from 12 all the way up. Uh, in fact, one Brady Luft, 12 years old, was able to be vaccinated today <laughs> at one of the Putnam County uh, vaccination clinics. He was very excited. His mother told me he didn't even cry, <laughs> although I'm sure he's complaining that his arm is sore by now. End <laughs> um, of year updates, I get a lot of, a lot of questions about it. We know there's been statements and, and removal of restrictions, although the restrictions are still in place, at least mass restrictions are still in place within schools. Um, but we're very eager for updated guidance regarding our end of year events, um, specifically the prom and graduation and moving up ceremonies so we could properly plan. We're still following guidance from April 27th, but we're hopeful that the state will provide new guidance that will be more aligned if uh, what we've heard sort of in the news regarding um, lim uh, less limitations on gatherings and needs for testing. Just a quick preview of some upcoming events. We have our seal of biliteracy presentations, which are very similar to the CAST presentations that uh, just ended, will be virtual. Our middle school musical is uh, Mary Poppins is scheduled for June 11th and 12th. We also have our elementary school musical production, Dates TBD. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the Westchester, um, school, uh, Westchester Partner School Board Association annual meeting, and Barb Parmley will be attending. 
And then certainly by next board meeting, there'll be many other end of year events, celebrations and performances that I can share. Thank you. Um, at this point, um, Ms. Bueno, do we have any questions uh, for public comment on the agenda items? We reached a peak of 13 people watching at 7.15. They, they should definitely get the presentation and Jess's comments on video at another time. Uh, so let's then move into new business. Um, this is, are we gonna go this order? Like, sure. I okay, we'll just go here. You, seat, so. yeah, you can say <laughs> where we are. Um, so I guess, um, Ms. Bromley, I'll ask you to start us off at number one. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> resolved on recommendation, but resolved by the Board of Education to accept the final vote tally for the budget vote and board election held on May 18th, 2021 as follows. Proposition one, budget. Yes, 430. No, 309. Board of Education, Helen Horowitz, 462. Barbara Parmley, 590. Write-ins, 44. Second. Questions or comments? Barbara can't congratulate herself, but I can certainly <laughs> congratulate us and the board for having her continue and uh, to add my welcome to Dr. Lufts to uh, Helen Horvitz. And thank you to the community. And definitely thank, thank you. you to the community for coming out and voting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number two. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve a revised 2020-21 school district calendar as per document number 183-21 attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? <laughs> We're changing the last two days of the school year. Uh, June 24th is now a half day and June 25th there'll be no school for students. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number three. Resolve on a recommendation of superintendent of schools to accept the resignation of the Director of Physical Education, Athletics, and Health, Brian Burrow, from the district, effective June 30, 2021, upon his appointment by the Minisink Valley School District Board of Education as an assistant principal in said district at their Board of Education meeting on May 20th, 2021. Second with remorse. As, I wonder if it's simultaneous. Isn't it happening right this minute, <laughs> the, the board meeting? Um, much congratulations. I mean, once, good luck to Brian. Uh, he will be missed. Thank you for your service. Yes. Absolutely. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number four. Resolves and recommendation of superintendent of schools to accept one resignation, accept the resignation of school monitor bus aide Colette Fishstrom from the district for the purpose of retirement, effective the close of business on Ju June 8th, 2021, as per document 184 slash 21, attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? I also want to thank Ms. Fisher for her service. She's been a rock for a very long time. And she oh. took good care of my kids some years, so. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, where are we, number five. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to appoint Harrison Deegan to a three week long term substitute teacher position at the middle school effective May 17th, 2021 through June 14th, 2021 or later at the discretion of the Board of Education at the substitute salary rate of $125 per day. Mr. Deegan holds social studies 712 Emergency COVID-19 certification. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number six. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to appoint Christine Stanianis as a teaching assistant in the 2021 ESY program at the rate of $125 per day for days worked. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number seven. Resolved on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to appoint Amanda Ortega to a probationary appointment as a school monitor, effective May 21st, 2021, 
the probationary period of 52 weeks, May 21st, 2022, at the elementary school on step one of the CSEA salary schedule. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number eight. Resolved to approve the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association 2021-22 nominating committee slate of offices and members of the board of directors and the 2021-22 proposed budget and authorize the Board of Education president to sign the Westchester Putnam School Board Association annual meeting ballot as per document 182-21 attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number nine, resolved that the Putnam Valley Central School District hereby nominates Peggy Zugaby for the New York State School Boards Association Area 10 Director for the 2022-23 school year. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number 10. Resolved on the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools to approve a supplemental memorandum of agreement between the district and the PVFT as per document number 190-21 as attached to the agenda and official minutes of this meeting. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to the consent agenda, number one. Resolved to approve consent agenda items two through 12 as appears on the consent agenda portion of this agenda. Second. Second. Questions or comments? How many times can I say agenda in one sentence? <laughs> 16. <laughs> okay. Did I say questions or comments? That was part of it. That was part of the yeah. questions or comments. Okay. Are we going to hear from Guy? All in favor? All in favor. Aye. 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 Guy's getting us ready Aye. for the sad days. <laughs> um, I'm so thrown off. Okay. Next is upcoming... Topics and presentation. Dr. Luft, any thoughts? Yeah, sorry. We have, so the June 3rd mm -hmm. is stacking up. We have scheduled for the work sessions. We have KG and D coming to do their five year facilities plan. We have an update scheduled for the anti racism committee. We have a couple of policy updates that will be presented to the board and a discussion regarding the moratorium allowing. Uh, children and faculty members currently attending PVCSD to continue in September. Uh, that's something we renew every year uh, and the possibility of a subsequent conversation along those same lines. Mm -hmm. On June 17th, we have our internal auditor scheduled uh, to give the report on the audit they did related to grant funds. Okay. Um, we got a email this the last couple days from the uh, Putnam Communities That Care Coalition that they have finished the survey that they do with our students and I think offering to come and present the results to the board. They have come before. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll uh, follow up with them. Yeah. Do we do that like every two I mean, years, I think, the survey? Yeah, it's not every it, year, it's every it, two it, years. It's not every year. year. Um, they had much, it said in the email they had much greater participation this year so that they're hoping that you know the numbers are more reflective because you know a greater percentage of the student population um, participated um, I mean we can look at the the document and analyze it ourselves but I think sometimes it's helpful to have them do it for us, so absolutely Okay. And given um, today's presentation, I wonder if it makes sense for us to get a, you know, uh, maybe this is too micro, but get a, an idea of what a modern uh, library specialist does, especially in the high school. The role of the librarian in this building is significant um, to what maybe the role would have been five or 10 years ago for sure. I wonder if uh, something along those lines. Um, well, and especially with the middle school getting a yeah. new library person and making sure that that feeds mm -hmm. directly into right. the high school. I was gonna say, I think all three schools would be beneficial. Well, but we don't have one so, at the elementary well, school. So True. <laughs> and now they're using I mean, the yeah, library but that, I'm, talk, I'm thinking school. the new position at the middle school, right. what she will do, I think it's great. 
Yeah. We just have a classroom at the middle school, at the elementary. Is there anything <laughs> else from the board? For the, for the state? I have to say, I'm so happy that my glasses didn't fog up because I didn't have to wear a mask. I can actually see what I'm reading. So that's a first since the first time we've come back live. Well, and the voices are so clear. I know. <laughs> I think I've touched my face 5,000 5, times. 5,000 teen times. 5,000 teen times. So I spent a long night. <laughs> Is that a number? a mask on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, I think, uh, Mr. Farr, you had mentioned something a couple of days ago. Are we, I think last year, Dr. Ruff, we didn't decide until like June 18th. Um, will we start thinking about what graduation looks like? Are, are there thoughts now? Is there three? Is there two? Is there one? <laughs> um, I'm happy to report what our plans are, subject to state changing their guidance. No, our intention is to hold one ceremony Great. for our students outside on the turf, limit number of guests to two guests per student um, the scheduled for the 18th of June with a rain date of the 20th. Oh, I don't right. remember the time off the top of my head, but that's our intention. Our intention is to have a single uh, ceremony and two guests per student. Having everyone together will obviously social distance, distance them as needed, um, but we're looking forward to having one are ceremony. You, are you not going to try to include the board and staff? But, which is fine. I, I mean, I think students and their families are more important. Um, I think I mean, as, but, as but the flexibility allows. But staff was always allows. a huge, you know, part too, so. Right, I think as flexibility allows, we intend to do so. Dr. Injury and I had that conversation the other day. We, we don't want to sort of throw out a blanket. Mm -hmm. Everybody should come, but we want to say is we have limited spots, so if you're interested in coming to let us know. You know. This way we have a list that we, if we mm -hmm. think we're going to exceed the limit, which we'll see what the limit is when that date comes. But we certainly want to encourage our staff. We know it's very meaningful for our elementary school teachers, especially who haven't seen the kids in many, many years, to have the opportunity to join. And certainly the board would be welcome to join as well. Okay. That's great. And right now, is it for our capacity, what is the number now that's allowed, given our capacity on that field? Well, there's, there's lots of different ones. It's just a matter of whether or not testing will be required or not. The initial guidance is off the top of my head. It was up to 250 guests. So it was actually just sort of shy of what we needed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was without testing. And obviously the students or the people on the field themselves don't count. But now that number has been increased for sort of general, but has not yet been updated for schools. So my hope is if they update it for schools and make it 500 without the need for testing, then we're in the clear. If they don't update it, my plan was to use the or two guests per student language that was in the mm -hmm. initial guidance, and we would use that to um, allow parents to come to the single ceremony. But if that is the language we're forced to follow, that would limit our ability to have other teachers coming. If we go up to 500, we have much greater flexibility. Is there anything else from the board at this time? And Maureen, do we have any? Ms. Blaner, do we have any questions? Okay. So at this time, hold on, I need to read. Um, I would like resolved on the rec recommendation of the superintendent of schools to an convene an executive session for two matters of collective negotiations pursuant to Article 14 of the Civil Service Law, the Taylor Law, and two matters are related to the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or a corporation or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, et cetera, of a particular person or corporation, after which time no further business will be conducted. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Enjoy the last month of school, everyone.